rejoice until his rapture's called abroad. Happy day, oh happy day, when Jesus walks my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live with Yeah. 
is indeed his disposal. Give him your adoration and give him all your praise. And give him all the glory for the Lord of all his days. He created you and me. He created all the world. He created you and me. He created all the world. God is in his, this is also, give him your adoration, and give him all your praise, and give him all the glory, for the Lord our God is praise. Oh my Lord is good, oh God is good.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and praise the Lord. We want to start the program this morning, and we want to take the opening prayer. We want to call upstage Pastor Steve Amumensan to lead us through the opening prayer. Shall we rise for prayer? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. Thank you that we are alive to see this day. Thank you for the gifts of sunshine, gifts of fresh air. Thank you, God, for our very beings. Thank you for the gift of health. We say praise be to your holy name. Jesus, you promised your disciples that the Holy Spirit will come and will glorify you because he will take of what is yours and show it to them. Father, we are here because of this. We submit to the Holy Spirit. Help us, O oh God, as Holy Spirit, you take of what is Christ's concerning this issue that we have come to discuss this morning. And show it to us, O oh God, that at the end of it all, glory will come to Jesus Christ, who alone is the greatest of all, the beginning and the end. We thank you, Father. We pray for those who are on their way coming, that you bring all of them safely here. We commit everything that we're going to do this morning to your hands. We pray for the lecturer. We pray for all the supporters. We pray for the chair. We pray for everybody here, O oh God, that everything shall be subject to God, to your name, and to your authority. We come against every interferences of contrary spirits this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. That nothing of God planned against this program will succeed. Father God, from the beginning to the end, Holy Spirit, we know you are in control. And Jesus is here to take glory. May your name alone be glorified. May your name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Steve. Amu Mensah. We still want to be on our feet. We want to be singing our opening hymn. Uh, before we do that, I will be calling some to come upstage to do some few things as time goes on. So, this one just to Pastor Moments and Pastor, you see, um, when you come, um, if you are short like me, you stand where I'm standing. But if you are very tall, when you come, We'll just step up, okay. Thank you very much. So, can we be upstanding as we we take our opening hymn? It's on the brochure. We singing, give me the wings of faith to rise. And the Elduna means minstrels will lead us through.
seated. Truly, may God give us the wings of faith to rise within the veil this morning and see how the saints who have gone ahead of us throughout the path we are treading today. Amen. People of God, I'm privileged to welcome you to the Berea Public Lecture Series for the tenth time in as many years. God's grace has been sufficient for all of us and for the Berea Public Lecture Series in particular. It's, it keeps getting bigger and better and more glorious. The Berea Public Lecture Series is actually helping to meet a critical need in the body of Christ in Africa and Ghana to be specific. Jason Mandrick, who is a researcher and analyst and a writer, wrote an article entitled The State of the Gospel and Global Christianity. The article sought to summarize the extent of the spread of Christianity and the state of the gospel worldwide, I mean the pure gospel worldwide in the 21st century. And reading his article, I was interested on the portion on Africa because that is where I'm from and that is where I am this morning. And of Africa, he had this to say. He said, millions have responded to the gospel, but in many cases, ungodly customs and worldviews plague the church. And he gave some recommendations. He said, there is critical need for theological institutions for curriculum appropriate to the African context. For African theologians, who can immerse their own people in scripture in a fitting manner. Berea Academy and the Berea Ministers Fellowship have risen to this critical need for more than 10 years now with a bi-monthly theological forum and an annual public lecture. By God's grace, this is the 10th in the series. And as I said earlier, it keeps getting bigger and better. I think the only downside is that as the years passes by, my hairline is receding by the years. But this morning, we are here for the 10th anniversary of the Berea Public Lecture Series. In the past 10 years, we have Staged here, we have brought to you several topics that has helped shape and correct some of the things plaguing the church in Ghana. Uh, those who began with us will notice that our very first lecture was not in this lecture hall. It was somewhere at Atomic where we considered Pentecostalism in Ghana, the origin, the impact, the controversies, and the schism over the years. We've done a couple more. We've looked at married or engaged. We examine customary marriage in the light of biblical revelation. Then we looked at prophecy or divination, where we examine modern day prophets and prophecy in biblical perspective. Last year, the, the last event, because of COVID, we could not do last year. We look at the Antichrist identified, 66 decoded, and it was quite instructive. This year is our 10th year. And we agree with Charles Spurgeon that the church does not determine what the Bible teaches. Rather, the Bible determines what the church must teach. So, in our 10th year, we are considering an issue that has been around for a long time that is not going away. You all know why we are here this morning. People of God, I welcome you to the 10th edition of the Berea Public Lecture. 
And as I said, it will never disappoint because God has never disappointed us. We know that at the end of the day, we shall live here better equipped, becoming better Christians who have better understanding of the scriptures. So on behalf of the planning committee, on behalf of the president of Beria Academy Ghana, on behalf of all the Beria movement, on behalf of the Beria Minister Fellowship, I welcome each and every one to this year's public lecture. To our guests online, you are also welcome. As we say, it's getting bigger and better. So now we have online guests far away from the UK, the US, Austria, and all over Europe. They are watching us. We welcome you. Get your questions ready as the lecture proceeds. And when it is Q&A time, certainly we'll have interaction with you. People of God, you are welcome. Thank you very much. At this point, we want to take some ministration from the Earl Dunamis Minstrels. This group has stood with us for the past 10 years. They have been our rented choir for 10 years. And uh, they also get, keep getting better by the day. And today, they will give us some melodious sounds in the house. Earl Dunamis Choir, over to you. Oh, my 
See, it's a very quite small in numbers, but they are big in voice. God bless you for that rendition. We have a chairman for this occasion. Uh, before we introduce the chairman, I want to acknowledge some few special guests here. We are all special, but we, I, will, I will acknowledge some few whilst I await my special list, my guest list to do more detailed introduction. Um, I can see Professor Shandoff. Professor Shandoff, you are welcome. Let's put our hands together to welcome Professor Shandoff. And I can see Professor Sapon as well. Professor, God bless you for coming. I will be introducing more as they come. And I can see, yes, yes, yes. I can see the former second lady of this nation in the person of uh, Mrs. Matilda and Mrs. Arthur. Let's put our hands together for Auntie Marty. At the right time, I will introduce the rest of the guests but we have somebody to introduce our chairperson for this morning. People of God, help me welcome our own sister, Chinoye Gezi, to do as the introduction. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen, and honored guests. On this occasion of our 10th annual Berea Lecture Series, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the chairperson for today. He is the immediate past national president of the Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship International Ghana, an international director of the fellowship and the Regional Vice President for Southern Africa. He is an industrial consultant by profession and the CEO of AFC Industries Limited. He is also the West Africa Coordinator for Unashamedly Ethical, 
an organization promoting ethics, values, and clean living. He serves on the boards of Teen Challenge Ghana and is a member of the Ghana National Prayer Breakfast Planning Committee. He is a graduate of the Berea Academy, the 40th term. He was educated at Infante Pym School and the City University London, where he graduated in international finance and banking. He served as managing director of South Achim Manufacturing Limited from 1980 until 1999, when he set up an industrial consultancy, Icon Limited. Without any further delay, please help me welcome our very own Mr. George Pra. All I can say is wow. I've never been introduced with a voice so charming. Can you do it again? <laughs> well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and what a joy it is to be part of this morning's Berea lecture for the 10th time in my life. The MC talked about his hairline receding. I'd like to remind him that he doesn't have a hairline. But we've been part of this annual lectures for many reasons, least of which is the fact that some of us have a passion for the truth and for correction to be brought into the body of Christ. Because as many of you would agree, there's been so much distortion and so much corruption of God's word which has led us as a body to be perhaps less effective than we ought to have been. And so we thank God for the Berea Lecture Series, and especially for our lecturer this morning, who shares that same passion that the Bereans had in Acts 17, 11. Not accepting everything they heard at face value, as we do today. But they searched the scriptures. They studied the scriptures to find out whether what Paul taught them was the truth or was not the truth. And so it is in the same spirit that we are gathered this morning to deal with a very important subject which I would say has brought a certain amount of controversy or lack of clarity to many Christians who really want to know God, who really want to serve God the right way, and yet are left confused by the variety of interpretations and distortions that apply to the subject matter of tithing. And so this morning, our lecture, Mandatory Tithing versus Voluntary Sacrificial Giving, whether the New Testament church is so timely and so important that we establish what the New Testament teaching actually teaches concerning this subject matter. And some say tithing belongs to the Old Testament, and therefore it is not scriptural today. Others would say that the tithes have been so abused by pastors, and that nowhere in the Bible is it mentioned that disciples paid a tithe to Jesus Christ. I've heard others say, argue that Jesus, they didn't pay tithes to Jesus because Jesus didn't need the tithes. And that when he had need, all he did was to send his disciple to catch a fish and found a coin 
in his month, so he didn't have need for tithes. Well, we'll give it to them. And some would say that, yes, but you accept the teachings, other teachings of the Old Testament, and you draw from them when it's convenient to you. But then when it comes to tithe, because it's talking about money, you dispute it. And so we become rather selective as to what we will accept and what we will not accept. Some I've heard say that, well, it is wrong for you to argue against tithe giving because the New Testament comes under the law and the prophets. And so you cannot ignore the teachings of the law and the prophets and just say that you will only accept what the New Testament teaches. Some say that, yes, we can cherry pick, and we do cherry pick because it suits our convenience, it suits our theology of the day, it suits our situation, and so they do that. But the diversity of views, as I'm sure many of us have seated here, call for an occasion like this, when we must examine what the Bible actually says and teaches. Because in as much as the Bible was written by men, it's a reflection of God's will and God's intent. And we cannot say that God's intent and his will is ambiguous. So there's a need for clarity. There's a need for certainty about any part and every part of God's word as we have it today. And that's why the Berea mission and the Berea annual lectures are so important in that consistently, and you hear some of the themes that they have been bold to address, themes like prophecy versus divination, because many do not know the difference, and many are lost in divination, believing they are benefiting from prophecy. It has addressed the matters of, is the rapture real, true? What does the Bible actually say about the rapture concerning what we traditionally be made to believe concerning the rapture? It has addressed the matter of dreams, an important matter, because many have assumed that every dream they dream or some dreams they dream are really God speaking to them. And therefore, all dreams lead to certain actions that sometimes have led many astray. So, to have certainty and clarity or what God words, God's word teaches and says is extremely important. And I believe that this morning we will leave here with a depth of clarity, a depth of knowledge, a depth of certainty to carry out to the rest of the body of Christ as we seek to bring understanding and, corrupt, and correction to the important subject matter of tithing. The Bereans were diligent, and so ought we to be diligent, especially for those of us who want to know God and serve him faithfully. We should be diligent in the study of the scriptures. And thank God that we are going to have this morning a fruit of such a diligent study on the subject matter that is to be addressed 
this morning. Whether we tithe or do not tithe or should tithe or should not tithe, I think one thing that is without doubt is that every genuine Christian who appreciates the grace of God, even in having his son shed his blood for our redemption, for our salvation, has a debt of gratitude to pay to our God for such amazing love and such grace that he has given us. And how we do it and what form we do it, whether it should be by compulsion or should be from a sincere and genuine heart, just as we express gratitude ordinarily in our day-to-day -day lives, we will come to find out at the end of the lecture this morning what the correct and the true and the right position should be. And even if tithing is practiced as a fulfillment of church tradition, just because a church needs resources, the body needs resources to grow and to expand, and whether that should be our sole motivation or one of our motivations, we will also have such clarity at the end of our lecture this morning. And so what I can assure you is that we are in for an exciting lecture, an exciting debate. We are in for settlement in our hearts and in our spirits as to what the real intent and the will and the desire of our Lord is in this matter. And if I know our lecturer very well, the position he will bring across this morning will be in alignment with the position of the Holy Spirit himself, who at the end of the day is our only teacher. He has the best capacity to bring to the fore God's intent on the subject matter. And so whatever your disposition, disposition be, whatever thoughts you have on the subject matter, one thing I know is that you will have an answer and a clarity, but you will be blessed because it is a blessing that is coming from the Holy Spirit. And so let's be attentive. Let's be ready with our questions because there will be many questions, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, we will be blessed and will be fulfilled and will rejoice and be glad that we came here this morning. I thank you very much. God richly bless you and enjoy the lecture as you do. And it's now my privilege to share the profiles of the responder to the lecture and the lecturer himself. Because after the presentation, somebody has the unenviable task of providing a response to the lecture that will be presented. And the response to this morning's 10th Berea Lecture will be given by none other than Reverend Dr. Frederick Mausi Amevenuku. Dr. Amevenuku is an ordained senior minister of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. He serves the Amaria and Danfa congregations in the Adenta district of the Meridian Presbytery. He is a senior lecturer in New Testament studies at the Trinity Theological Seminary in Legon, Accra. And at the Trinity Theological Seminary, Seminary, he also serves as the director of graduate studies. He obtained his PhD in New Testament studies from the Stellenbosch University, South Africa, 
where he now also serves as a research fellow at the Department of Old and New Testaments. His research interests include biblical interpretation, gospel studies, mother tongue hermeneutics, systematic theology, and he's married to Jifa, with whom he has been blessed with children. You can see from these credentials that he's best qualified to respond to such a lecture this morning. Shall we put our hands together again for him? And now it's my privilege to introduce or share the profile of our distinguished lecturer this morning. Dr. Kwabna Dakwa Amano is the senior pastor of the Crossroads Community Church, Accra, and the director of Beria Academy, Crossroads Community Church branch. He has the calling of a pastor, teacher, and has been in this business of teaching the Word of God in full-time capacity since 1997. He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture, in Animal Science to be precise, and his Master's of Philosophy, and his MPhil in Animal Science, Microbiology, and Immunology from the University of Ghana, where he was also actively involved in Christian ministry. His theological education began at the Berea International Theological Seminary in Seoul, South Korea, where he obtained his Master's in Divinity degree and was also privileged to study under the pastor of the world's largest Baptist church, Dr. Kim Dong Kim of the Sun Rag Baptist Church, Seoul, Korea. He later also obtained his doctorate in theology from the Ghana campus of the Florida-based International Theological Seminary. He has taught in a number of Bible schools in Ghana, including Beria Academy, International Theological Seminary, Agape Bible School, Victory International Bible Institute, Shalom Victory Bible College, and the Bible College of Ghana. He's also the main resource person of the Berea Ministers Fellowship, a fellowship that brings together ministers of independent churches for continuous theological education, for fellowship, and for mutual support. His teaching emphasis is on challenging the church to move away from theology that is rooted in mere intellectualism, human traditions, and imaginations to a theology that is rooted in the Bible, especially the New Testament. It's my privilege to call him my pastor also. And I believe that we are going to be extremely well fed through this important lecture we shall be sharing, having this morning. May I invite the El Dunamis Choir to bless us with a song before the lecturer comes to the podium. Thank you very much.
Mr. Chairman, uh, special guests, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thank you most sincerely for your presence and participation in this year's lecture. We can only thank God as an academy for his grace that has brought us this far today to the 10th in a series of burial lectures since its inception in 2011. But for the COVID-19 pandemic, which made it inconvenient for us to have the 2021 lecture, today's lecture would have been the 11th in the series. The Berea Lecture Series is Berea Academy's contribution to our country's theological discourse. We call ourselves Bereans because of our resolve to take after the noble attitude of the Jewish attendees of a synagogue in Berea in relation to the scriptures. Otherwise, Berea is only the name of an ancient Macedonian city in northern Greece, which became part of the Roman Empire. The name of this city has, however, gained fame in Christian theology in representing a positive example of how a person or community should respond to biblical teaching. In their second missionary journey, Paul and Silas came to Berea from Thessalonica, which they had been forced to leave by the disbelieving Jews who disbelieved and attacked Paul and Silas Sorry, and preach in the Jewish synagogue in Berea. Unlike the Jews in Thessalonica, who disbelieved and attacked Paul and Silas, many of the Jews in the synagogue of Berea eagerly received their message 
but later did a candid examination of the apostolic message in the light of their scriptures to be sure whether it was true. This attitude of the ancient Jewish Bereans has become a model for all who desire to grow spiritually in the right way today. Such are called to eagerly learn from God's word, and no matter who the teacher is, to investigate any teaching in the light of the scriptures. It is in this Berean spirit of critically examining Christian teaching and doctrine in the light of the scriptures, regardless of their source, that all our previous lectures have been conducted. This year's lecture is similarly the critical examination of a popular Christian doctrine known as tithing in the light of the scriptures. The objective is to ascertain where the New Testament church should stand in relation to the two biblical practices of mandatory tithing and voluntary sacrificial giving. Mr. Chairman, it must be stated that the choice of the subject matter for this year's lecture was deliberate. The decision to discuss tithing, which is a tenth of incomes demanded by the church from parishioners, was because this year's lecture is also our tenth in the series of annual burial lectures. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, please help me to thank my wife, Ifia, who is the brain behind <laughs> who is the brain behind the lecture series and has over the years driven herself beyond herself with the planning committee to ensure the success of every one of our lectures. I also owe a debt of gratitude to members and associates of the Crossroads Community Church and Berea Academy for their prayer and financial support for their lectures over the years. May their labor and sacrifices never be in vain in Jesus' name. I also thank the elder Miss Mistrels who have been available to spice the lectures with good spiritual songs over the years. Mr. Chairman, giving one-tenth of one's income as tithe to God is one of the most popular doctrines of many Christian denominations and churches. This is not only because it is a source of predictable income to the churches, but also because it is believed to be God's portion which carries grave consequences if withheld. Above all, its popularity as a church doctrine is because of the belief by many Christians in its potential for attracting God's favor. Windows of heaven are believed to be open for blessings beyond storage capacity to fall from God upon the faithful tither. But does God really demand 10% of incomes from Christians? Does he give back to tithers unlimited blessings and punish non-tithers with curses? Does he make tithers financially prosperous and renders non-tithers poor? Do Christians who fail to give 10% of their incomes to God rob him and become subject to calamities? If answers to these questions are in the affirmative, then God did not make himself clear at all in the New Testament, the manual he gave to guide the faith and practice of Christianity. The New Testament scarcely discusses the need for believers in Christ to mandatorily give 10% of their incomes to God. The Bible has no record of any believer in Christ in any of the New Testament churches who regularly give 10% of their incomes in cash or in kind to God. However, it has the record of many instances of believers in the New Testament churches who gave 
freely and voluntarily various sums of money from their own hearts to God in support of the churches and their workers, sometimes even beyond their abilities. There are recorded instances of Jewish believers in Christ selling their lands, houses, and other property and bringing not just 10% of the proceeds for, but everything to be shared among the needy in the infant church in Acts chapter 2, chapter 4, and chapter 5. Only two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and one epistle, the book of Hebrews, mention tithing in the New Testament. In the Gospels, Jesus mentioned tithing only twice. One in his castigation of the Pharisees for their legalistic and meticulous attention to tithing while neglecting justice and the love of God required as well by the law of Moses in Matthew 23, 23. The other is in the parable he told to warn the Pharisees against self-righteousness in Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. In the book of Hebrews, tithing is mentioned in six verses of only one chapter, that is chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 8, and verse 9. And even in the book of Hebrews, there is no hint of an instruction for New Testament believers to mandatorily give a tithe or 10% of their incomes to God. The book of Hebrews only uses the payment of tithe by Abraham to Melchizedek to show the superiority of Jesus' priesthood to the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. This was done by the writer of the book to convince some Jewish believers who, as a result of persecution, were contemplating apostatizing from Christianity back to Judaism. It was to demonstrate to them that since the Christ priest of Christianity, whose priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical priesthood of Judaism, it was pointless for them to abandon the superior Christian faith and return to the inferior Old Testament religion of Judaism. Isn't it amazing that a subject that is scarcely discussed in the post-Christian New Testament has become such an important doctrine in the church today? If tithing were such an important doctrine of Christianity, its conspicuous absence in the epistles of the New Testament is surprising because it is in the epistles that the nature of the life, the doctrine, the faith, the practices, and the governing structures of the early first century church are well and adequately laid out. Any doctrine that is hardly prominent in the epistles of the New Testament can therefore be safely considered not Christian. The New Testament does not link the receiving of God's blessings, especially material prosperity, to the giving of 10% of incomes to God. And neither does it link curses of fruitlessness and calamities to the failure to do so. The New Testament does not portray God as fixated on 10% as a magical proportion that connects the believer's giving to his financial prosperity and his not giving to his poverty. To prove otherwise, one has to depend on the Old Testament, but not the New Testament. Bishop Doug Heward Mills in his book, why non-tithing Christians become poor and tithing Christians can become rich has listed over 80 different curses pronounced by God upon non-tithers, all of which are from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Malachi, Zechariah, Psalms, and Proverbs. The Bible does not promote tithing as a universal divine principle for the prosperity of humanity. Otherwise, it would have been required of Adam at the beginning of creation or after the deluge of Noah's days, when man was given a chance to repopulate the earth. None of the 19 patriarchs before Abraham, beginning from Adam, had a commandment to give 10% of incomes to God and did give it in exchange of divine blessings. Abraham is the first person recorded in the Bible to have tithe. He gave a tenth of the spoils of war, but not his income to Melchizedek. This was a voluntary act, keeping with the prevailing customs of the Semitic people of which he was a part. 
but not according to a divine revelation or a commandment of God. It is in the law of Moses that God incorporated the Semitic customary practice of tithing as part of his over 600 commandments to be collected by the Levites from the 11 other tribes as remuneration for the work they did in leading Israel's worship of God. Numbers chapter 18 and Hebrews chapter 7 verse 5. Now the history and types of tithing. What is a tithe? The word tithe is a Greek word that simply means one-tenth in English. One sheep out of a flock of ten sheep or one bag of maize out of ten bags is thus a tithe. Under the Mosaic law, the tithe was one-tenth of the produce of the land of Israel and the increase of the head of livestock given to God for the Levites, the poor, strangers, widows, and orphans. The origin of tithing. Tithing was widespread in antiquity and found among the Semitic people of the Mediterranean region as a cultural tax system. According to Sundays, the practice of tithing, whether as a sacrifice to, in honor of a god or a tax in payment to a ruler, was also common among the ancient people of Greece, Rome, Lydia, Arabia, Babylon, and Persia. There are two references to tithing in the Bible before the law of Moses. They are Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek from the spoils of war and Jacob's pledge to give a tenth to God if he blessed him and brought him back to his father's house. These two instances were either one-time voluntary offerings or a cultural practice of their times, but not by a commandment of God. Before the law of Moses, the Bible does not record anyone giving tithes to God as a yearly, monthly, or weekly practice. The types of tithes. Three main types of tithes are identified in the law of Moses. They are the Levitical tithe, the cultic or the festive tithe, and the benevolent or the poor tithe. The tithe of the tithe could even be considered as the fourth. The Levitical tithe was a tithe given to the Levites by the 11 other tribes of Israel as their remuneration for the work they did in leading Israel's worship in the temple. The cultic or festive tithe, this was the tithe of grain, wine, and the firstborn of livestock sent to Jerusalem to eat for a feast before the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 14. If the journey was too long for a family, the Lord permitted her to sell them and in Jerusalem purchase him with the money for the, for the feast. This is what promoted the turning of Jesus' father's house into a marketplace and a den of thieves. The benevolent or poor tithe. It was the tithe of every third year in the seven-year cycle of the Jewish calendar. That is the third year and the sixth year. Reserved for the Levites, the strangers, the orphans, and the widows, in the lands allotted to the 11 other tribes, Deuteronomy chapter 14. The tithe of the tithes. It was the tithe given to the priest by the Levites after they had received the tithes from the 11 other tribes of Israel, Numbers chapter 18. No tithes on the sabbatical years. A sabbatical year was the seventh year in a seven year cycle in the Jewish calendar. No tithes were paid in sabbatical years. The sabbatical year was a year of rest for the land of Israel, as the Sabbath day was a day of rest for the people of Israel. No planting or harvesting was done in the sabbatical year. As a result, tithes were broken off during the sabbatical years. Tithes were not even paid in crops 
that yielded on their own without cultivation because they were considered ownerless and therefore could not be presented by anyone as tied to God or to the Levites. In a nutshell, the biblical tithe was not the simple calculation of 10% of one's monthly gross or net income. There were different types of tithes paid to particular recipients in particular years in a seven-year cycle and stored in particular places. In the end, the people of Israel paid not only 10% of the increase of their farm produce, but more than that, in certain years, they paid two times, one for the Levites and one for celebration in Jerusalem or for the poor. The purpose of tithing in the law of Moses. Tithing in the law of Moses served several purposes, which include one, remuneration for the landless Levites. The tithes were given primarily as remuneration for the Levites for their work in leading Israel in the worship of God in the temple to an act of Jewish worship. The people of Israel brought a tenth of their harvest and the increase of their livestock to God as a recognition of him as their source of life in the increase of their labors. In the history of Israel, the restoration of tithing was always a sign of a revival or reformation of worship, 2 Chronicles and Nehemiah chapter 13, 2 Chronicles 31. Backsliding Israel always withheld the tithes from God. This caused the priests and Levites to abandon their work, causing the neglect of the worship of God. The third is a charity opportunity to cater for the disadvantage in the ancient Israeli societies. The poor, widows, orphans, strangers, and the landless Levites were, were catered for through tithing every third year of the seven-year cycle of the Jewish calendar. Now, rules regarding tithing. Mr. Chairman, tithing in ancient Israel was not arbitrary. Strict rules regulated tithing in the law of Moses. The rules included the following. One, God's required tithe was food, but not cash. Leviticus 27, Malachi 3, and Matthew 23. The tithe was paid with only food crops and livestock, but never with cash. And this was not because money was not in use at the time. The baker, the shekel, and the talent, for instance, are mentioned several times in the books of Moses as the currencies in use during the era of Moses, Exodus chapter 38. The people of Israel also spoiled the Egyptians and had a lot of money from them before leaving Egypt. God, however, never asked them to give money or cash as tithes. Two, God's required tithe was food from the land of Israel. Only the land of Israel was holy land, which had a holy city and a holy temple. Tithes of food crops and clean livestock from lands other than Israel sent anywhere other than the holy temple in the holy city of Israel were defiled and unacceptable to God. Three, tithe payment was annually. Tithes were paid annually at the end of the harvest or the counting of livestock. It was not weekly or monthly. Four, tithes were paid by only ancient Jews to only the Levites. Anyone other than an ancient Israeli who paid tithes to a person other than a Levite broke God's law. Modern day Jews even cannot give acceptable tithes to God. Now, why the Levites? One may ask why only the Levites were made the primary recipients of the tithes from the 11 other tribes of Israel. The reasons for this include the following. 
The Levites were consecrated to replace the firstborns of Israel as God's own. God acquired title to Israel's firstborn of both human and animal when he spared their lives but struck the firstborns of Egypt. The firstborns of human and of animals in Israel therefore became the most favored of Israel. In place of the firstborns of Israel, however, the Levites were later consecrated to become the most favored of the Lord. Two, the Levites alone remained loyal to the Lord and were rewarded for their loyalty. When all Israel worshipped the golden calf in rebellion, and Moses stood at the gates of the camp and asked, Who is on the Lord's side? Only the sons of Levi gathered to Moses and proved to be the only ones on the Lord's side. They were thus rewarded for their loyalty to the Lord with the service of the Lord, lost by the firstborn of the whole nation. Three, they were not counted among the people of Israel because of their separation unto God for the service of the Lord. In the census to count the people of Israel, God instructed Moses not to count the Levites along with the other Israelites, but to set them apart and appoint them to be in charge of the spiritual responsibilities of the tabernacle. Numbers chapter 1. The priesthood that belonged to the tribe of Levi as a reward from God, and they served a sacerdotal role in the religious life of the children of Israel. For the Levites were the only tribe blessed to live off the offerings and tithes from the other tribes. The Levites had no inheritance among the tribes of Israel. The Lord was their inheritance in place of land. Therefore, the tithes and food offerings that were brought to God because they became their inheritance. Whereas the other tribes worked the land in order to eat, the Levites were blessed and made dependent on the tithes and food gifts that the other 11 tribes gave to God. Is the giving of a tenth of the, of the spoils of war by Abraham to Melchizedek a justification for Christian tithing? Quite often, the giving of a tenth of the spoils of war by Abraham to Melchizedek is made a basis for Christian tithing. However, neither for the Jews under the law of Moses nor believers under the new covenant has Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek be made a basis for tithe paying in the Bible. The Jews pay tithes to fulfill a requirement of the law of Moses, but not as a practice handed over to them by their father Abraham. Melchizedek, who is mentioned only twice in the Old Testament, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110, and in only one book of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, was important in the divine economy, not in his historical personality as a divinely chosen person, but as a type of Christ. Historically, he was a Canaanite Gentile priest king who was considered greater than Abraham only because he was a king and priest of his clan. If he were greater than Abraham in relation to God's eternal purposes, him, but not Abraham, would have been used as a progenitor of the Messiah and the source of blessing for humanity. It was Abraham, but not Melchizedek, who had the promises of God, Hebrews 7, 6, was the friend of God, 2 Chronicles 27 and James 2, 23. He is mentioned by name 312 times in the Bible. Melchizedek only two times in the Old Testament and a few times in the New Testament from only one book. The writer of the book of Hebrews developed the typical representation of Jesus by Melchizedek in the context of Genesis 14. He presented Jesus' priesthood as heavenly, without end, and superior to the Aaronic priesthood, which was earthly, 
ended by death and inferior to that of Christ. And applied Psalm 110 verse 4 to Jesus in the context of Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek in Genesis 14. The Jews counted anyone whose birth records and lineage could not be found in their genealogical records as not having father or mother, beginning of days or end of life, and anyone who could not trace his lineage to Levi in their records as a priest. Ezra 2.59 and 61.63, Nehemiah 7.63-65. Melchizedek, who was a Canaanite, was thus considered by the Jews as without genealogy, beginning of days or end of life, Hebrews 7, 3 and 6. But though he did not trace his lineage to Levi, he was a priest of the Most High. His priesthood, therefore, perfectly typologically fitted Jesus' eternal non-Levitical priesthood as against the temporal Levitical priesthood. He only resembled the Son of God in his everlasting priesthood, but was not a son of God himself. Do modern-day Jews pay the biblical tithe? Modern-day Jews do not pay the biblical tithe, and the reasons are not far-fetched. Biblical tithes are closely related to the temple in Jerusalem and the tribe of Levi. Tithes were sent to the temple storehouse and were to be received by the Levites. In, in the AD 70 war with the Romans, the Jerusalem temple was completely destroyed with all the Jewish genealogical records kept in it. And in the absence of the genealogical records, Jewish tribal identities are indeterminable. Modern day Jews, therefore, do not have the tribal identities that ancient Jews had, making it difficult for Levites to be identified to receive the tithes. These make it difficult for a modern day Jew to pay the biblical tithes without breaking the law of Moses. Modern day Jews, however, hope in the, in the reconstruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and the restoration of the Levitical priesthood and temple sacrificial worship. At that unknown time in the future, Jews living in the tithing zone will be required to resume the payment of the Levitical tithe as stipulated in the law of Moses. Whether this hope will ever be realized is a subject for another lecture. <laughs> what I can say for now is that I consider it to be a wasteful hope. Since God is not returning to the old covenant, having abolished, ended, and fulfilled it in Christ's death on the cross. Christ is the new priest, and his priesthood is forever, and is never going to hand it over to the Lev Levi's priest again. True worshipers now do not need a physical temple or a priesthood to worship God. The new covenant church is the temple, and believers are priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 21 to 24. How do modern day Jews finance synagogue activities? The absence of the temple in Jerusalem has deprived world Jewry of sacrificial worship led by the Levites, since that can only be performed in the temple in Jerusalem. Jews gather in their many synagogues around the world only for Jewish prayers, non-sacrificial worship, Torah instructions, and other religious and social activities under the leadership of rabbis who don't have to be Levites. The activities of synagogues are financially supported through dues and voluntary pledges that members pay. Another source of financing synagogue, synagogues is the adoption of the patron system in which members or families buy seating places in the synagogues. These fundraising methods of financing synagogues 
do not violate any requirement in the law of Moses because, in this case, the money is paid to the synagogue but not to an ordained Levite who is difficult to identify now. New covenant giving. Giving as worship to God did not end with the old covenant but continued as a principle into the new covenant. Giving as worship to God is the natural demonstration of gratitude to God by the old covenant person chosen in Abraham, as well as the new covenant person elected in Christ Jesus. The methods, types, and purposes for giving, however, are those that differ in the two areas. Characteristics of new covenant giving. Number one, new covenant giving is voluntary. New covenant giving is not mandatory, but entirely voluntary. The new covenant believer is not pressured to give, but admonished to give freely without compulsion in proportion to how much the Lord has blessed him. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Two, new covenant giving is individual. Each person decides on which percentage of their incomes to give to the church. It is not the 10% of monthly income usually decided on by the church and made mandatory for everyone. Covenant giving is item that an individual could give in support of the church under the new covenant. People give freely in the spirit of generosity. Barnabas sold his land and brought all the proceeds, 100%, to the apostles to be given to the needy in the early church. Acts chapter 4, verse 36, 37. The poor and afflicted Corinthians gave according to their ability and beyond their ability. They gave more than 100%. For new covenant giving is cheerful. Not many good things can be done cheerfully, such as mourning with the bereaved. New covenant giving, however, is to be done with cheerfulness because God loves the cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 7. Giving to God to regret and complain later is unprofitable. Giving happily without regrets and complaints is the godly way to give and the spirit that underlies all giving to God, particularly new covenant giving. Five, new covenant giving is sowing and reaping. The Bible promises a payback for every form of giving. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Whoever sows his financial and material resources into kingdom work will be duly rewarded by the Lord. God is the one who gives seed to the sower and the same who, supply, who multiplies the seed the sower sows in faith and in obedience to the word of God. The fact that God gives back to the giver, however, does not warrant the giving to receive syndrome in today's church called seed faith. Giving to receive from God is akin to an attempt to purchase God's blessings with offerings or an attempt to bribe or blackmail God with offerings. This is referred to as simony, named after Simeon, who wanted to buy the ability to transfer the power of the Holy Spirit to others. It attracted a rebuke and a curse from Peter the Apostle. Six, new covenant reward for giving is proportional to the seed sown. According to the Apostle Paul, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This makes God a just God who repays his children in proportion to the sacrifices they make in giving to him. 
Seeds are, however, valued in percentage, but not in quantum terms. This is how come the poor widow, who gave a few coins, gave more than the rich, who gave bundles of paper money. Because in relation to them, she gave 100%, while they gave sums nowhere near 100%. So a new covenant giving is in response to needs. New covenant giving is not a religious duty and obligation as tithing and other forms of giving were in the Old Testament. New covenant giving is mainly in response to the needs of God's people and for God's work. Members who had lands and other possessions in the early church sold them and brought the proceeds to the feet of the apostles for distribution to members as they had need, Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4. Seven deacons in the early days of the church were selected and ordained to be responsible for this kind of distribution. Christians who pay their tithes or give 10% of their incomes to the church and suppose that they have fully fulfilled their obligations and therefore are done for the month should remember that new covenant giving is not for the fulfillment of an obligation but in response to the needs of the church. If one has been blessed with material wealth, no percentage of it given to the church is enough while the church has needs. Believers are supposed to give in proportion to how much the Lord has blessed them and in response to needs. Modern history of tithing. Giving in the first century Church of the Apostles was purely voluntary. Members of the church who had property sold them and proceeds from the sale were brought and put at the feet of the apostles for distribution to members as they had need. There is no record of a mandatory tithe paying in the early church. This situation of free will offering to support the church lasted for about 300 years. Mandatory tithing for the sustenance of the church and her bishops and priests became a practice in the church in the 6th century when the church came under the Roman government during the reign of Emperor Constantine. One of the issues of the church councils at the time was tithing. As a result of the councils, tithing was experimented in the Roman Catholic Church but it fell into disuse over time. The ecclesiastical development of the demand for tithes. The church fathers who followed after the apostles of the Lord Jesus were the first to allude to the need for Christians to pay tithes. They, however, did not make these demands for tithes mandatory. It was voluntary. The next major allusion to tithe paying in the church were by the church councils, notably the Council of Tours, A.D. 567, the Council of Marcon, A.D. 585, the Council of Rowan, A.D. 650, the Council of Nantes, A.D. 660, and the Council of Meds. They favored tithings of land and produce. Christian kings and emperors of Europe made the made tithe paying a common practice in the Roman Empire and Western Christendom. Over time, it became, a, it became general for a tenth of incomes to be paid to the church. Tithe paying was, however, optional until Innocent III, the most significant pope of the Middle Ages, who, in, a, in an address to the Archbishop of Canterbury in AD 1200, made a decretal requiring tithes to be paid to the clergy of the parish to which payees belonged. About this time also, tithes, which had originally been reconfined to agricultural produce, were extended to every species of profit and to the wages of every kind of labor. The Roman Catholic Church on tithing. The Roman Catholic Church does not mandate the payment of tithes by its members. It, however, expects the faithful to voluntarily provide for the financial and other needs of the parishes they belong to. In the Middle Ages, following the councils of Tours and of Marcon, 
the Roman Catholic Church experimented with tithing. The experiment with mandatory tithing failed and fell into disuse after the Protestant Reformation, the French Revolution, and the growing secularization of civil governments in Europe. The Protestant, the Reform the Protestant Reformation and tithing. Martin Luther and John Calvin, chief architects of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, were not favorably disposed towards mandatory tithing for believers. They saw in tithing a command in the law of Moses for ancient Israel, but not for new covenant Christians. Though modern day Baptists, Presbyterians and Methodists advocate for mandatory tithing, their forebears were not that disposed towards making tithing mandatory for Christians. The philosophy of church support for, by early Baptists, Presbyterians and Methodists emphasized voluntary support on the congregational level. The secular and political uses of tithe. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in AD 395. In this age, and through the medieval age in Europe, there were hardly any separation between church and state. Medieval Europe was wholly Roman Catholic, with a church building in every community and cathedrals in larger towns and cities. The secularization of tithing in Europe began from the sixth century, when the church became rich and owned lands and exacted tithes from those who rented the lands of the church. For many centuries, the right to collect agricultural tithes in Europe switched from the church to the secular and political authorities, depending on who was stronger. Pope Innocent III, in the 13th century, for instance, ordered that tithes for the support of the church should be given precedence over all other taxes. When the Bible got translated into the language of the common man, and people started to read it for themselves. Opposition against the mandatory payment of tithes as tax arose. In Germany, England, and France, revolt against the payment of tithes were rife. To the extent that in 1789, tithes were abolished in France by the secular authority, and by 1850 had been made voluntary in England. In 1871, tithes were abolished in Ireland, and in 1887, they ended in Italy. In the United States of America, tithing and even weekly offerings did not become the standard way of funding the church until the 19th century, when state funding of churches through taxes ended. Colonial America American churches did not depend on voluntary weekly giving from their members. Instead, as had been the case in Europe, the government established churches and supported them financially. Since churches serve the public good by raising citizens of good, good character, the public also deemed it fit to fund church activities through taxes and fees. In the 20th century, the United States conservative Christian emphasis on tithing stemmed largely from the efforts of a Chicago businessman, Thomas Kane, who distributed pamphlets promoting tithing to as many as 75% of the evangelical pastors in the country during the last quarter of the 19th century and prompted a number of writers to pen a series of larger influential books on the subject. Conclusion. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, tithing is undoubtedly a doctrine in the Old Testament. It is a prominent legislation in the Mosaic law and a practice even in the period before the Mosaic law. The Semitic people of the Mediterranean region practiced tithing as a cultural tax system long before the law of Moses. The God of the Hebrews incorporated this cultural tax system of the Mediterranean region into the law of Moses for his people Israel. Tithing in the law of Moses was primarily to cater for the nutritional needs of 
the Levites who had the priesthood, the poor, strangers, widows, and orphans. Any Israelite who failed or refused to send the tithes to the storehouse for distribution to the Levites therefore robbed God of that which was primarily his and was severely punished with curses. That is because he committed a grievous offense of causing the neglect of the worship of God which took place in the temple. The Levites abandoned their work in the temple to look for food any time the Israelites failed or refused to bring the tithes to the storehouse for their upkeep. Tithing, therefore, had a direct correspondence with the worship of God in the Old Testament due to its effect on the availability of the Levites in the temple area to supervise the worship of God. In the New Testament, this connection is not obvious. New Testament worship is not dependent on a physical temple and a human priesthood, but is perfectly conducted anywhere at any time in spirit and in truth according to the revelation of the eternal Christ and high priest who has made all believers in him holy priesthood. Believers in Christ are built into a spiritual house of worship and offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The New Testament therefore does not require a priesthood similar to the Levitical priesthood to to require mandatory tithing. The New Testament is in favor of voluntary sacrificial giving as worship to God and support for the church and his workers. This is evidenced in the book of Acts that records the origins and history of the New Testament church and the epistles written to guide her life and practices. A mandatory uh, giving of 10% of the incomes of believers in Christ as worship to God or a means of prosperity is not taught in the post-Christian New Testament. The book of Acts tells of many believers who sold their lands and other possessions and brought the proceeds to the feet of the apostles for distribution to the needy in the early church. New Testament churches. Barnabas, who was even a Levite and was supposed to be landless and the recipient of tithes, rather had land which he sold for the proceeds to be given to the needy. This example of a Levite Having saleable land is one indication of the change from the law of Moses and his demands to a new order. For only a change from the law of Moses to a different order makes it possible for a Levite to own saleable land. And a change from the law of Moses means a change in the law regarding the Levitical priesthood, since the Levitical priesthood was established by the law of Moses. According to the book of Hebrews, when the priesthood changed, the law regarding the priesthood, such as the law of tithing, also changed. The new priest of the new order is the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not collect tithes while he ministered on earth because he was unqualified to do so, being from the tribe of Judah, but not Levi, and will not collect it now because he remains, even in heaven, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The women's group among the disciples gave freely and voluntarily from their own resources to support his ministry. Having poured out his Holy Spirit and grace from heaven on his church, his work must continue to be supported by grace giving freely and voluntarily. He does not condone any mandatory giving of a priest of a prescribed percentage of his children's incomes to support his ministry. It is not a command by him or by any of the apostles in any part of the post-Christian epistles. The use of Abraham's tithe to Melchizedek as a justification for Christian tithing is quite erroneous because not even to ancient Jews was it used as a basis for tithe paying. Ancient Jews paid tithes in, in fulfillment of an obligation in the law of Moses but not because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. The enigmatic Melchizedek is important in the divine revelation only as a type of Christ, but not as a divinely ordained priest for the worship of God. He was a a Gentile 
who was considered greater than Abraham only in his position as a king and priest of his Canaanite clan. His designation as a priest was perhaps because he preserved the knowledge of God among his Canaanite people. The book of Hebrews only uses Abraham's tie to him to prove the superiority of Jesus' priesthood to that of the Levites. Melchizedek, Melchizedek's use in the discourse was only for a typological significance. It is an established fact historically that neither the Roman Catholic Church nor the leaders of the Protestant Reformation who spearheaded the establishment of the Protestant and Reformed churches endorsed the payment of tithes. Martin Luther, the theological father of the Lutherans, John Calvin, the theological father of the Baptists and Presbyterians, John, and John Wesley, the theological founder of the Methodists, Nazarenes, and Salvation Army, all rejected tithing because to them it was Jewish legalism. Many pastors know about the truth concerning tithing. They know very well that it is an Old Testament requirement, which is not demanded of New Testament believers. However, they are reluctant to stop using it as a fundraising strategy because of the regular, predictable, and greater source of income that it takes for their churches. There must, however, be a way of raising money without misleading Christians about what God expects of them. It is misleading and an untruth to make church people feel obliged by God in the scriptures to give 10% of their income to God and to fund church activities. Finally, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is quite obvious from the discussions so far that mandatory tithing, though taught in the Bible, is not taught as a Christian practice, but a Mosaic law requirement in the Old Testament. It is therefore Jewish but not Christian. The attempt to make New Testament believers feel obligated to give 10% of their incomes as a requirement of God is tantamount to wrongly applying the laws of one country in the courts of another, or unlawfully using an abrogated law to make a case in the law court. New Testament giving is not mandatory and not a prescribed percentage of incomes paid as a tax or a debt owed. It is voluntary, individual, cheerful, generous, in proportion to God's blessing, a seed sown, sacrificial, and a grace gift. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mano, for that excellent delivery. The next high point I'm waiting for is a question and answer session. But before we go there, we will get a response from our special guest. Before we do that also, here at the Berea Lectures, we have a custom of taking voluntary offerings. <laughs> it has never been mandatory. Before we take the offering, we, we want to admonish you with Apostle Paul admonishing that he who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. <laughs> and he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And as a good brother who loves you, I want you to sow bountifully to support the cause of the Berea Lecture. The Berea Lecture is a self-sponsored program uh, because in the history uh, of our existence, uh, we've tried all that we can to get external support. But as you know, anything that borders on the church and the Christianity 
um, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really gel with the corporate world. So it's, it's a self-sponsored entity. So when you come around on our lecture day, what you give goes a long way to defray um, the cost of organizing the lecture, which is forever rising. So we want to encourage you uh, voluntarily give bountifully, and the Lord will bless you. So uh, that El Dynamis Minstrels will lead us to take our offer tray for this occasion. Thank you very much. I think we'll be sitting for long. Can we all rise? Um, it's advice uh, medically to stretch up a little. But it can also form a praise unto God. So give God some dance in the house. Whilst we benefit from it as well. So the envelopes in the programs, you can put your offering in that envelope and drop it in the bowls as they come around. Got the offering bowl upstage here because we're still having our offer tree in our hands. So please come up here. We also want to be blessed. It appears the spirit of the lecture is caught up with so many. You are not moving. You are not moving. You see, the spirit of God is all over this place. I want you to be moving. Give us one more song quickly. I want to see you move. There's somebody there who wants to make some move. He's in blue, but he's been hindered by two people by him. Please come into the house and get it done for us. Thank you. 
Shall we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to support your work voluntarily. We ask that you also bless us because we have supported your work. However, do that voluntarily in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Can we please be seated? So... As promised earlier, for the first time in the Berea Lecture series, we're going to get a response to the lecture. And the response will be coming from Reverend Dr. F. M. Amavanku, who's a senior lecturer of the Trinity Theological Seminary. People of God, help me welcome. Reverend Dr. Amavenku. Mr. Chairman, distinguished lecturer, senior pastor, friend, sisters and brothers in Christ, I deem it a great honor to be given the opportunity to give a response to this exciting lecture that we have heard. Indeed, when you sit in a lecture, at the end of which there is an overwhelming standing ovation and signaling that the listeners have endorsed the lecture in totality, if you are asked as a scholar to give a response, I suppose <laughs> you're only required to praise the speaker and, and go in peace. Uh, that's, that's how I feel at this point. Um, but I know traditionally that a response to a lecture from a scholarly perspective also requires a critique. Um, I shall attempt to fulfill all righteousness, but... At the same time, um, I have to already associate myself with, um, I would say, most, most of the claims that the, the speaker has made. And to say to him, congratulations. Congratulations. Well, at this point, let me attempt a kind of a summary. And I'll start with this line. By all means, raise money to support God's work, but do not manipulate people. I think that's what he was saying to us. And he gave evidence for him from the scriptures. It's not as if uh, the claims are from his imagination. And that is what makes my work easy. So the topic was tithing, mandatory tithing versus voluntary sacrificial giving with the New Testament church. When I listened to him at the end of the lecture, one of the things that crossed my mind was to describe the imposition of obligatory tithing on Christians as Christian Elevi. <laughs> Christian Elevi, right? <laughs> uh, so, Christian Elevi. Because he says that the pastors know the truth and they don't want to uphold it. 
And I remember a reggae songwriter who says, they know that I know, and I know that they know. <laughs> so Christians know, uh, the pastors know, but this is predictable source of income. I am told there are some uh, as of Umaminum who even say to the, uh, the people to whom they are indebted, uh, when my husband returns, I'll pay, because he's coming home with uh, part of the tight money. <laughs> Well, um, as the Dr. Amano indicated, the lecture was given in the spirit of Berea, and he indicated that Berea is merely an ancient Macedonian city which became part of the Roman Empire. And but for the reference in Acts chapter 17, Berea would have been an insignificant word. The the reason why it is important is because the mention of Berea reminds us of the need for us to respond to biblical teaching. There is the need for a response. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. That is the syndrome destroying African Christianity. Because once the Bible says, then it means you cannot comment on it. That's the impression we are given, but that's not true. And I noticed also from the lecture that even though Dr. Amano didn't use these words, he kept reminding us that the Bible is both for Jews and for Christians. It is both for Jews and Christians. It's not only for Christians. In fact, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, is, is appropriately known as the Hebrew Bible. And it is the same Bible people use to practice their Judaism. After all, Bible is from a Greek word which simply means book. So it is a Jewish book and it is also a Christian book. Christians should not claim monopoly over the whole of it. And Dr. Mano made the point that no matter who the teacher is, the lecture, the teaching ought to be examined by Christians. So where should the New Testament church stand? If the tithe is a source of predictable income for the church, and pastors have conveniently manipulated some passages to indicate to Christians that they are under a curse if they do not pay the tithe, and if they have succeeded in convincing most people in a very populist manner that it is only through tithing that you receive God's favor, and that there's the need for people to be faithful tithers where does the New Testament church stand? Does God demand the tithe? That's clear enough in the Old Testament. God demanded it. And notice I'm using the past tense. God demanded it for the Jewish worshiper. Does God also demand it for the New Testament worshiper? The Kamano says no. The evidence is free voluntary giving which we also already find in several references in the New Testament. People selling their lands, houses, and other property, bringing the money to the feet of the apostles so that the needy community may benefit from it. In the New Testament, there are three references or so to the tithe. Jesus' popular critique of the legalistic Pharisees Matthew 23, 23, and the parallel passage in Luke 18, 9 to 14. Then those references in the book of Hebrews. Dr. Amano argued that Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood, and that was the point the Hebrew references sought to make or seek to make. And he inquired if Titan were such an important doctrine for New Testament Christians or post-New Testament Christians, its absence in the epistles of the Bible, epistles of the New Testament, is very surprising because as he convincingly argued, it is in those epistles that we find Christian leaders responding to problems in their various Christian communities using the Gospels and Christian tradition as a basis. 
the New Testament does not link success to the 10% giving of the tithe or point to any curses In the, in the event of the lack of it. He mentions Abraham's tithe and reminded everyone that Abraham gave a tithe only once and it was voluntary, it was not com com commanded by anyone. And he gave the spoils of war, he did not give from his property. Abraham was very rich, remember. The Jacob tithe as well was referred to, it was one time and it was voluntary. And he mentioned that Titan got eventually incorporated into the Mosaic law. These are all facts. No one can dispute them. Anybody who is willing to be honest cannot dispute them. The tithes benefited Levites, the poor, the widows, and some aliens, and so on. He even refers to various types of tithes, Levitical, festive, and then benevolent. The benevolent tithe you perhaps can also call the poor tithe or the charity tithe. And he also mentioned the tithe of tithes which the Levites who were priest assistants gave to the chief priest or the high priest. And um, if you connect that with the Levitical priesthood then we still, we still have only three types of tithe. Now it is very important that Dr. Mano mentions the connection of the tithe with the seven year cycle of the Israelites. The sabbatical year, for example, was a year in which no tithes were collected at all. And mentioning sabbatical year, perhaps for those of you who are not familiar with the use of sabbatical in, in the biblical context and in other contexts, I would just like to mention, for example, that in 2017, I went on a sabbatical leave. And that was, that was the last time I went on leave. So <laughs> the last time I went on leave was in 2017. And um, as, as an academic, I don't have another leave until 2054. Oh, sorry, 2024, which means that another seven year has to come before I can go on leave. So I, I understand this sabbatical year thing. <laughs> now, Dr. Mano says that the demand on the OT worshiper um, was as follows. The Mosaic law required people to pay the tithe. And number one, the tithe served as remuneration for the landless, landless Le Levites. In other words, that's from the, what what gave them their pay as um, people who led Israel in worship. Two, the tithe was also a worship activity. The giving of the tithe was a worship activity for the Israelites. Three, it serves the purpose of charity. In other words, it was a welfare scheme, an ancient Jewish welfare scheme uh, meant to help the Levites, the poor, the widows, and the landless. Think about what we do with the tithes today. And he mentioned some rules um, under the Mosaic law. Tithes of food and crops. In other words, food crops plus livestock was the tithes to be given, not money. He gave evidence that um, money as a means of exchange was already in place. He mentioned some of the type of monies they spent. And again, so he emphasized the need for people to understand that it was food and livestock from the land of Israel, not from foreign lands. Remember, this was land God himself had promised to the people, and eventually they landed there, and so they needed to give their produce um, as, uh, as um, the tithe. Remember as well that it was during the journey from ancient Israel, sorry, the journey from ancient Egypt to the promised land that the the law, the Mosaic law itself was given, which eventually uh, mandated a tithe. Dr. Amano reminded us that the tithe in ancient Israel was by means of an annual payment. So annual payments paid in, paid in ancient Israel 
And he even reminded us that modern day Jews do not pay the biblical tithe. 21st century Israel, Bennett Israel, do not pay the tithe. And those of you who may not know, I would like you to perhaps just search using your search engine to find out the percentage of uh, 21st century Israelites, the modern state of Israel created in 1965. Find out how many percentage are Christian. Because I know there are people in Ghana who, based on Psalm 122, say that they are praying for the peace of Israel so they will be blessed. You find out what percentage of Israelites are Christians in the first place. One of my senior colleagues visited Nazareth not too long ago, Jesus' hometown. Even there, Christians are in the minority. That should tell you something. And to help to get Christians, African Christians in particular, reflecting. Now, Dr. Mano indicated that the destruction of the temple by the Jews, sorry, by the Romans, um, the Levites, sorry, the Gentiles in uh, AD 70, is responsible also for the erosion of the tithe tradition in Israel. Because trying to find the tribal identity today will be uh, an impossible task. There's no way to determine a Levite today because all the records have been eroded because of war. And when he made that point, the description of Israel that came to my mind was a nation on the move. A nation on the move. They, they can't even be very sure of who they are and where they belong to and all. But then Dr. Mano would make the point that as far as Titan is concerned, it has been abolished, it has, it has been ended, it has been fulfilled, fulfilled in Christ. And you should remember Matthew 5, 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Some people only see the word, I have not come to abolish. They only see abolish. They don't see fulfill. <laughs> there is fulfill in there. So you should also pay attention to that. And then some information about the current synagogues, the rabbis, and how they lead non-sacrificial worship, and so on. Um, New Testament or New Covenant giving. It's voluntary, it is individual, it is generous, it is cheerful, it's, it's based on seed sowing, um, it has nothing to do with giving to receive, it has not, nothing to do with bargaining with God uh, for blessings, it is proportionate to one's income, it is, in fact, in response to needs. Mandatory Titan started in the 6th century, and it even later on got its fuel from ecclesiastical decree. Ecclesiastical decrees are, uh, they, may be, they may be Christian traditions, but they are also human. Anamibua. <laughs> ecclesiastical decree. Anyway, today a lot of Ghanaians based on uh, Job, 22, 28, right? Say that they are decreeing and declaring. <laughs> decreeing and declaring. I don't know what kind of decrees those are. <laughs> and I don't know who whom those decrees bind anyway. <laughs> um, Dr. Manon made a significant point that even the Roman Catholic Church does not demand mandatory tithe for their members. For those of you who are Presbyterians, Baptists, Lutherans, uh, Salvation Army and so on he also reminded you of your history and as an ordained minister of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and there is, there is an upgrade to what you said I'm the district pastor for the Adenta district so if you come to that place you'll find me there maybe I should invite Dr. Amano and his people to my place <laughs> now the reason I'm making this point is I sat in a synod in a dense synod. In those days, we were not doing what we call today General Assembly. So synod was the highest decision-making body. I sat in one of the synods as a student church leader, a youth leader, 22 years ago, when for the first time the church decided that they were going to collect the tithes. I listened to the debate very carefully. I didn't understand anything much. After all, I, I wasn't a minister at that time. 
Uh, I've been minister only for 17 years. See why he's my senior colleague. <laughs> and, but I studied the rationale of the decision later. I was very disappointed. The Synod did not say it was doctrinally mandatory for us. In fact, though they didn't use those words, it, um, they came across as saying, we want to raise funds. It is working for other people. Let's also do it. Synod, highest decision-making body. Because we are Presbyterians. And while well, history goes back to John Calvin, and as he rightly said, John Calvin, John Calvin never demanded mandatory tithing from anybody. He saw it as legalistic religion, legalistic Christianity. Anyway, a few um, critiques uh, to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, these are not weaknesses. I would say that um, one of the obvious, uh, I don't know how obvious it will be to others, one of the obvious uh, critiques will point to the fact that Dr. Mano did not deliberately make a case for mandatory tithing. He needed to do that to convince those who write books and mention uh, how many cases? <laughs> how many cases? Almost 100. <laughs> so uh, you needed a, a component. I know the lecture was long and you don't have all the time, but you needed a component to point to that at least to satisfy those who, who normally bring me a question such as, are you against the tight? They want a yes and no. I tell them, no, we don't answer questions, those kinds of questions. <laughs> now, again, the point that I find missing is the fact that in Israel, not everyone paid the tight. Not everyone paid. It was only peasants those who worked the land and uh, reared animals and so on, they only paid. If you were an artisan and your duty was to um, build or do some other things that have nothing to do with the land, you didn't pay the tithe. And yet, today we make it look like it was everyone. It was everyone. In fact, they just approach it in a well, well in fashion. So some people were non-peasant, I would say, were excluded, and that point needed to be made. Again, the question of the Mosaic Covenant. Is it eternal? Does it have eternal validity? Was it meant to fulfill a certain role and no more? He did not address that. I know it's controversial, but I, I, I thought that it would have strengthened the paper even further. Then the references to two passages, Luke 6, 38 and 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Well, somebody might raise an objection. If you look at the context of Luke 6, 38, it has nothing to do with giving of money. In fact, even though many Christians have memorized it and they say it everywhere, it has to do with judgment, judging your neighbor. You only need to look at the context. Using it to support or challenge any argument relating to Titan is not convincing. The other one, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, again, though it teaches individual, uh, intentional, premeditated giving, it is also in reference to the specific collections that Paul made for poor Israel, poor Jerusalem, from the Gentile churches. Since it has nothing to do with the tithe, I'm sure that Dr. Amano, your opponents would like to point you to that one. Well, finally, I, I have, if you listen to the way I'm speaking, you know that I have done a lot of research on Titan and uh, I've published a number of things. One of the things I found out was that even in, under the old covenant, the OT worshiper mandated to give the tithe was required to pay up to 23% of their income. And then I tried to put percentages on the sacrificial giving of the New Testament, that came to about 40%. So it tells you that if Christians, pastors in particular, were willing to do the hard work and were willing to teach their members to give sacrificially, the church would have received far more than it is receiving by using threats. threats. <laughs> On this note, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity.
thank you very much, Dr. Amevanku. In fact, his name means, in the Ewe language, that familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> yes. Uh, Amevanku. Sister Nipa, and <laughs> I, I believe that many of us who stand here, Dr. Mano, including myself, because your eyes have seen this and all that we have said, your, your eyes are beginning to pain you. <laughs> anyway, but thank you, Dr. Mervyn. I think you taught me one thing. I know from here, you know, the public lecture, because of, of the nature, because we want to examine the scriptures again, Sometimes we come here and uh, um, the pepper enters the eyes of the Presbyterians. Sometimes it's the Methodists. Sometimes it's other people. But today, I think the pepper is in all eyes here. <laughs> and I know that after here, people who were not in the lecture will walk to you. Are you for or against tight? <laughs> Tell them that we don't answer yes and no. <laughs> In this, <laughs> please um, note this number down 054 028 6052. I go over again 054 028. Six zero five two. I believe we are okay with that. I should go over again. Okay, zero five four zero two eight six zero five two. That is the Momo number for Beria Academy. Um, some whispered to me that they could not give their offering. They want to send it. They want to pay e levy. So. They did not drop their offering. <laughs> so please, um, you are you are liberty to send your donations through the Momo number given. Uh, as when the lecture commenced, we did acknowledge some special guests, and some have joined, and we want to acknowledge their presence. Uh, we want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Ni Kwashi Alote. He is the Director General of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority. Doc, can we see you? Thank you very much. I've already introduced Professor Daniel Bruce Sapon. And then we have Dr. ACC. Shall we see Dr. ACC? Okay, she's stepped out. Then we have Miss, Dr. Mrs. Evelyn Odro. Dr. Mrs. Evelyn Odro, okay. Then we have Dr. Bafo Ampate. <laughs> Dr. Bafo Ampate is a, a lecturer from the All Nations University. Let's put our hands together for him again. Then we have Reverend Emmanuel Ahlija. He's the immediate past general secretary of the Ghana Fellowship of Evangelical Students. Let's put a hand. Wait. <laughs> Reverend, okay, 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 okay. I didn't make you out. Yes, your, your, look, your look is different in our 10th year. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> okay, we also have in here uh, Mr. and Mrs. Amua. Mr. Moore was once a chairman of one of our lecture. I don't remember the number, but he was one. Yes, the origin, transmission, and translation of the Bible. Mr. Moore was our chairman for that occasion. And uh, he's the West Africa director of Biblica, the, the right holders of the NIV Bible. So let's, let's, let's welcome. Yes, I also want to acknowledge members of the Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship who are in here. Let's see you wave on to us. Yes. 
There are many businessmen in the house, so it makes a job I will do very soon very easy for me. Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge the Berea Lecture Planning Committee and the lecture support team. They are also in attendance. Shall we see you by hand? The indefatigable chairman is in and is seated at the back. I also want to introduce one person before I call for the next item. Many of us know him on the screen, but now he is a minister of the gospel. Uh, Reverend Yorsen is at the back. Shall we see you? <laughs> God bless you. Wache, they call him. <laughs> so you are welcome. God bless you. At this point, before we continue, we want to take up a song ministration from Dorothy Tego and Isaac Yorsen. So from one Yorsen to another Yorsen. Um, Dorothy Tego and Isaac Yorsen. Let's put our hands together as they give us a song. God bless you.
Thank you very much. Dorothy and Isaac, God richly bless you. Very soon we will zoom into the question and answer section. But before we do that, every single year, at the end of the lecture, there is a book to accompany the lecture. As you all bear witness with me, the time is too short to present everything verbatim. So, um, to today's or this year's topic is in this book. I mean, the, all the content is in this book. So we are not really doing a book launch, but we just want to quickly get this book out so that we'll get all that you need to know in this book. Um, because we have special people here today, and because giving have been made voluntary, um, I want to do it in a different style. I don't want to mention any money, because when I mention it, indirectly is mandatory kind of. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the work we're doing and looking at the need, when we began, I read a report for you that sought to look at the state of the gospel on the various continents. And I told you that for Africa, they said the gospel has deep penetration. But the problem is that there are a lot of unbiblical practices that have crept into the church. Recommendations were there. African theologians should rise up with strong institutions to correct this. And that is what the Berea movement seek to do. I know there are many other bodies like Biblical and Co. also doing the same. But you have to support what we're doing so we can do more to help the faith on our continent. So today, we have some gold bags here. They contain some souvenirs, our 10th anniversary souvenir contains some, something to drink and contains something to chew. In fact, this is the first time I was seeing this chocolate. It is called Tyas. Tyas Orient. So we're taking you to Oriental times, not only in the topic, but uh, in terms of souvenir. And then we have five of the books bundled in each pack. So because it's a day of voluntarism, um, I want somebody to get up and give me um, he, the, the, the amount she wants to donate to support this and pick this. <laughs> Come again. No, I'm not giving minimum, but I'm still, I'm still uh, uh, admonishing you that he who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. So, um, it is, it is in your power to decide what to do. So who will set the ball rolling for us? Uh, certainly, the countenance of a man sharpens the other person's countenance. So what you do first will determine what the others will do. So we are looking up to you. Jesus is looking up to you. There are angels in the midst. They are all beholding us this morning. So who is taking the first bag? Let us know how much you're giving to support there is a hand. Where is the hand? Okay, sir. Please do come forward. Let's, let's put our hands together to our first volunteer. Ha! The second person is also coming. Okay. So, please. No, I won't give it to you first. Ah, it was the mic you were asking for. Thank you very much. A thousand cities. Whoa! God bless you. A thousand cities. For this back, so please the usher suit. Yes, sir. Thousand. Another thousand. God bless you. Do we have more people helping the cause? Yes, please come. Please, when your hands go up, just come forward. Let, let's come forward and let's support this worthy cause. Let's support this worthy cause. I want you to say it yourself so that a uh, hundred US dollars. Oh, uh, one hundred US dollars. So, God bless you. Please, you, I don't say, please, please, you will be attended to.
God bless you so please the ushers please who else is coming thank you very much someone from biblical a thousand Ghana cities yes you can help yourself thank you very much one thousand god bless you god bless you one thousand only who else is coming is somebody else coming is somebody else coming it's not mandatory so don't think it's packed at thousand you can go two thousand The, the chairman want to take one, but the chairman want to be anonymous with what he is giving. Are we agreeing to that? <laughs> okay. He said he had the right to act voluntarily and he's deciding <laughs> to be anonymous with Mr. Mom. So please give one to chairman for me. Yes, please. Are you doing the line of chairman? Okay, 2000. God bless you. God bless you. Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Who else is coming? I believe we all have different capacities based on how much God has blessed us. Don't be intimidated by those of us because the giving is not mandatory. I like that. I like that man. Never mandatory. That has every man has kept both in his heart. So whatever you have in your heart, please have a big one on the back. God bless you. Any more? One thousand. One thousand. Now, I, I've been a pastor for a long time now. So I told you that whatever you do, it's exactly what everybody will be doing. But this one, it is not by coercion. This one is as you purpose in your heart. I pray that God will bless all those who are helping this God. Yes, sir. Thank you. 1,000, I told you. So let the 1,000 flow, flow. But then, once again, it is what you have purpose in your heart. Don't be, don't be, don't be intimidated by the 1,000 and the 100 US dollars. Uh-huh. You please. Yes, sir. See, hundred dollars, hundred dollars. So, somebody too is coming. A thousand Ghana, a hundred dollars. <laughs> okay, five hundred Ghana cities. God bless you. Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Are we getting somebody come? Is somebody else coming? Yes, Apostle J. B. Adu. 200 Ghana cities. God bless you. Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Do we have anybody for the gold bag? Uh, we have some silver bags as well. So let I think we can finish the gold bag, then we'll go to silver bags quickly. Do we have, as you purpose in your heart, as you are enabled by God? Yes, God bless you. Let's put our hands together for our sister as she comes forward. <laughs> 200 Ghana cities, God bless you. Who else is coming? Who else is coming? Yes, sir. 
Reverend Ahlejah is giving us 500 Ghana cities. God bless you. Hundred dollars. Thank you. God bless you. Two hundred Ghana cities. God bless you. Yes, that's the choir director for El Dunamis Minstrel. Come on. Hundred Ghana cities. God bless you. 200 Ghana cities. God bless you. 500 Ghana cities. God bless you. Please let's support this worthy cause. Yes, there comes Ni Ni Mate Commodore. Yes. Hundred Ghana cities. God bless you. Okay, we have three more of the good bags to go. Biblical. Okay, Mrs. Samoa. Yes. Hundred Ghana cities. God bless you. God bless you. Mrs. Samoa. Oh, you get one. You have to get one for your husband too. Okay, the two shall be one. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Please, let's come forward and support this worthy cause. So we have the... Whilst we have it, please get your questions ready because the next item on the bill is the Q&A session. Oh, 1,000 Ghana cities. God bless you. God bless you. We have some few silver bags to go. Let's get them off the table. And then we will be nearing the end of today's lecture. Yes, yeah, somebody is coming from the back. Five hundred Ghana City Doctor Amwatin, God bless you. Oh prof, sorry. <laughs> Professor, God bless you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, more are arriving, and the youngsters are also arriving. Yes. Is it three in one? Okay. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We have four more. Yes, more are arriving. Let's put our hands together for them as they come forward. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God richly bless you. In fact, voluntary giving is so liberating. Yeah. So it moves faster than I anticipated. So because of that, you see, for the very first time, the givers are faster than the ushers. So they, they couldn't locate some of you. So if you've, you've taken the bag and you've not been attended to by an usher, please just raise your hand. Please, ushers, please see the hands and get close and take the details. If, if you pick one and uh, your details have not been taken, let's see you by hand. Let's see you by hand. Let's see you by hand. All right, so we will continue the program, but 
is coming. More are coming, but we want to probably we have to probably do two things at the same time. Um, whilst we allow people to pick and give in their money. Everybody here must get at least a copy of the book. So what we're going to do is that after the bags are gone, the ushers will come around with the books. You give us anything 30 Ghana cities and above, you pick a copy of the book. Meanwhile, all the previous lectures books are on sales at the front. So when we close, don't be in a hurry to leave. Just stop by the table, look at all the series and look at the book you want to own. So not long from here, we'll be coming around with the books, even as the questions go on. All we're asking for is a silver collection of 30 cities or more and pick a copy. You, you shouldn't live here without a copy of the book because the details are in the book. God richly bless you. Amen. I will ask uh, Pastor Moments uh, to just pray for all those who uh, supported us this afternoon. Just um, bless them for me. Thank you, Father. Your word is true. Nobody gives and sows into your kingdom and do not receive a blessing. Your people are saying they have done as is required of them. But you are a faithful God and you remember them. So Father God, in blessing, bless your people even, in, even as they have responded to your call to meet a need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we'll continue where the bags are here. The books will come around. As I said, 30 cities or more, you pick one. If you are led to pick the bag, you can still come forward. We'll take your details to get it done. So we're moving on to the next segment of the program. That's the question and answer session. Because we have online audience and the camera is at the back zooming this way, I will want two of the the choristers uh, mics to be placed in here. So when you want to ask the question, you raise your hand, you acknowledge, I call you, you come forward, ask your question. But please, be brief with it. One man, one question for now. Um, if there is need for follow-up later and we have time, we'll do that. Mind you, we also have online audiences and we'll be taking their questions and we'll be reading them out. So... Um, Mr. Chairman, with your knowledge, I open the question and answer segment. But please, we just want to say that this exercise has been part of the church's history since time immemorial. If there are issues, they meet, they talk, they present papers, they read a conclusion. Nobody fights over this. So please, we don't want any fights. So far, it's been a serene day. Let's keep it that way. If you disagree, let, let's, let's share it in a brotherly manner and we'll move on from here. So, any question so far? Okay, I see one hand up. So, I will acknowledge five hands at a time and then they take turns to come. So, I've seen one, two. Okay, so the two can start coming. When you come, you tell us your name. I'll, I'll prefer the mic to face the audience so that they, they also face the audience so the camera can pick them. Thank you very much. Okay. So you tell us your name and where you're from and then your question. And it will be noted and answered. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Please, uh -huh. my name is Tony Awiti. I come from Yerifa. Uh, my first question is: In the bag there is a, this thing, a straw. What is the straw for? Uh, 
Please, uh, you ask him that in the which bag? The gold bag I took, there's a straw in it. What is the straw for? A straw. Yes. To drink. Yes. Yeah, because there's a drink in the bag. There's no drink in your bag. It's an oversight. So we'll, we'll voluntarily put one in your bag. <laughs> okay, now my question is, Please, please, can you face the mic? We are listening. You talk about giving, it shall be given to you. I don't, can you explain that issue? Can you face the mic? We will hear you. When you were talking, you said, give, and it shall be given to you. You were referring to the lecturer's something he made. But I didn't get that place well. Can you explain it better? Okay. So that question is to the respondent who, who said Luke 6 actually does not talk about money. So I think he will respond to that in appropriate time. Can we take that question, please? Thank you very much. My name is Francis Yaoda. I'm a Catholic. I'm coming from St. Joseph, the Waker Catholic Church, Media. My question is, uh, I, I just read recently in the Business and Financial Times about uh, the advantages of, of Titan. In fact, it was published in the Business and Financial Times and even graphic. And per what the writer mentioned, he enumerated a lot of things about giving a Titan, where God will bless you and all those things, just as the doctor has said. So I'm just uh, asking. So those things that the writer mentioned, and I know most people also think that when you are tightened, you, go, you get those uh, uh, blessings. Is it uh, misinformation or misclassification of that kind of blessing that they get that is not the tightening that is why they are getting that blessings, but it's rather other things, but they are misclassifying it as because of the tightening. So that's my question. Thank you very much. The question has been captured, it will be answered. Any more? Yes, the third one, then we'll take the response quickly. All right. My name is Prince Ajay from All Nation Full Gospel Church. Um, my questions are two. Uh, sowing bountifully and receiving bountifully, and sowing sparingly and reaping sparingly. I want to know if Paul was talking about eternal reward. I mean, the ripping. Is the ripping eternal reward or material reward? And then secondly, I want to also find out, um, you said in your lectures that we should sow into the work of God or to support the work of God. I want you to define the work of God. What is the work of God? I want to know um, what believers' financial or voluntary giving should support in the church. Is it the building or the poor and the needy? I also want clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much. So those are three questions. I think that should be enough for the response. After the response, we will take other questions, if there are any. OK, Doc. OK, so we'll ask Dr. Amavonku to respond to the Luke 16. Thank you for the question. Luke 6, 38. I would like to read it first. Um, I know it's a popular test. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And that is the passage that people quote often. But let us go um, to the beginning of the test. Verse 1. One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked some herds of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some Pharisees said, Why are you doing the, what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is 
which is not lawful for, for any, but the priest to eat, and gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to them, he said to the man who had a withered hand, Come and stand here. He got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to him, I ask you, is it lawful to do good on the, or to harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now during those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. And when they came, he called his disciples and chose twelve of them, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called a zealot, and Judas, son of James, and his Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out, of, out from him and healed them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are those who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will be loved. Blessed are you who, when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For, what, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, after the, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Now 30. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your, your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them to do. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you, you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you receive. You get back. Amen. Now, what I'm drawing your attention to is for you to pay attention to the context of every Bible test you read. Here, Jesus is giving assorted instructions, uh, ranging on a number of things, disputes over the Sabbath, and yet we even hear how Jesus went to pray uh, all night prayer, came back, selected his disciples, and began to give them all kinds of instructions. This specific one, 38, belongs to the same section with 37. And it is, that's what I read earlier. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, will will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. So this is about your attitude towards other people. See, 
um, judging people is like giving them judgment. And if you judge them in accordance with a certain standard, it is the same standard that you will be judged. And that's the point the author is making. Thank you. Thank you. But I used that, that scripture. Uh, I applied it to mean that whatever you give, it will be given back to you in multiples. So when you give judgment, you get it back. If you forgive, you get it. If you give money, you get it back. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I was wondering why what Tides was doing in the Business and Financial Times. I think it's supposed to be a spiritual activity done in the church. What is it doing in the business and financial time? It is business over there. So they are, they are saying that just like in Europe, in the medieval ages, when it became not just a spiritual thing that was done, but a, a duty, a business activity in Europe. So people are, there are some people who even believe that even if you are not a believer and you pay tithes, God will bless you. How can God bless a non-believer because he gave 10% of his stolen money? So uh, the business of financial times, I don't know what purpose tithes was serving over there. But I think what many people want to say is that when you give, to God, God will bless you. But instead they say, if you tithe. Tithe is also another form of giving to God. Here we are saying that it was just limited to the ancient Israelis. But today God has also given us many ways of giving to support the work of God. And whatever you do to support his work or his workers, you will be rewarded. So if Financial Times is advising Christians to give to support God's work and be blessed, that is in order. But if they are saying it is business, then for God it is not business. It is a spiritual activity. It is worship in the ancient times. We too have our way of worshiping with our monies to support God's work. And uh, the next question is uh, bountifully. And yes, God... God blesses us physically and, and eternally. So whatever you give genuinely and sincerely from your heart, you get a temporal blessing as well as an eternal blessing if it is giving well sincerely from your heart. Just as if you forgive, you'll be forgiving. Uh, it's not in eternity that you'll be forgiven. You'll be forgiving here. Uh -huh. God says if you forgive others, he will also forgive you. If you don't, he will not also forgive you. Uh, so yes, if you give sincerely from your heart, in, in, you will receive a proportionate blessing. If it is temporal and God decides that it should be, you will get it. If it's eternal and God decides that it should be eternal, you will get the eternal blessing. Or you will get both the temporal and the eternal blessing. Then, uh, what is the work of God? <laughs> the work of God... It's everything that goes to glorify the name of God and expand the kingdom of God. So if you are giving towards soul winning, this is the work of God. If you are giving to support a pastor who is laboring in the vineyard of the Lord, you are, it is the work of God. If, you, if, a, if a, child, a, a child has admission in your church and uh, needs to pay within a certain time in order to get admission to the university and you are there and God has blessed you with man and you decide to go to Dubai with your child. When you know very well that by the time you come back that child would have lost the, the this is the work of God. You give, you pay school fees to a needy child. This is the work of God. So in the church, God expects us to look around and look for where we can charity opportunity, as Dr. Melvin Co said. This is what the church was doing primarily. You ask, is it in the building? In fact, we must learn from Europe. 
when they invested too much in the concrete and not in the people, now they have lost the people and the concrete is being sold to Muslims. If they had invested in the people and without concrete, the people will still be there and the people will rise up to build the concrete later. So today we are not learning from what happened to Europe in medieval times. People are investing so much in buildings, in concrete. Just a simple structure for worship is just what you need. You don't need to build over 10 years a multi, multi, <laughs> multi, uh, multi, what, I've forgotten the word. A mega church, but there is something, multi uh, purpose, where you have even a swimming pool and you even have a, a, a basketball court. You want to do all of that. All we need is just a place to gather for worship. In the past, they met in homes. But the Holy Ghost was there powerfully working. So we invest too much in the structures and we, we, we neglect the real church. That is not the work of God. If people are in need in the church and you are rather putting it in the concrete, that is not the work of God. The work of God is in helping real, the real church, which is the souls, the temple. Amen. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, some hands are coming up, but I will read two online questions, and then the two will come. So the two at the back, and then the hand here. There was somebody here too. Yes. Yeah, so please stand by the mic. All the others come this way so that when I see you standing, when I see you standing, that's their condition. Not all of them, the three I called, the rest still be seated. I will come to you at the right time. So they, I've called three people to join. So please, before you ask a question, though, there is an anonymous guest online. Say, thank you, Dr. Mano. Please, how do you suggest that men of God and their families are taken care of today? especially those who are full-time ministers. That's the first question. The Kwabena is asking, is giving in the church today based on needs? What do you consider as needs? Again, to what extent and for what should pastors depend on the church? The third question online. Thanks. So how do we then prevent the situation? This is from Timothy. How then do we prevent a situation whereby members stop giving due to financial challenges? How would the church fund its activities, including soul winning? So these are the online questions. Um, we'll take two now, making five. So the third person, just resume your seat. I will call you again. So please mount the mic. Mount the mic. Just wait for him to finish. Then you, you bring yours. Yes. Please. Thank you very much. Please. My first question. Um, from the from the presentation, I realized that um, sowing and reaping is is not condemned or is good. So I wanted to ask: Is it wrong if someone sows financially into the kingdom of God and expects um, results, like expects answer? Um, for instance, I have a prayer topic or something that is on my heart, and then I take money, and I said, oh God, this is my offering. I'm giving to the kingdom of God, but this is what I'm expecting. Is it good to have such a, a prayer topic? And secondly, it's related, though, that what do you say to the practice where um, we sow into if sowing is good and what do you say to the practice where we sow into the, the grace of the man of God or we sow into the anointing 
to 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 yeah so when a prophetic word is released you you really give an offering to activate the prophetic word Uh, so your question is first the first one showing into the prayer topic and then ask an active activator uh, activator for the grace to flow okay so the next question please And my husband will always come. We have to pay. We have to pay this tithe because we are owing God. We can't go without paying. And I'm so happy that today he's here with me. So my dear, from today we'll give out of love for God, not mandatorily. Thank you very much, doctor. God bless. Well, please. 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 This session is Q&A session. <laughs> We will do another, another uh, lecture on uh, uh, post-marital counseling. <laughs> and that one, you can come. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's my kid sister, so that's why I took it to that level. Thank you. Uh, amen. amen. How should men of God be catered for? Uh, I don't know why in the Old Testament... God made it mandatory for the people of Israel to give 10% of their harvest to support those who were leading their worship, probably because of the stubbornness of the people of Israel. They didn't have grace, and probably if you gave them uh, the room, they would not do it. Besides, don't forget, the tithe was not the only remuneration for the Levites. All the sacrifices that the people of Israel brought a portion went to the house of the Levites. This is what early saints were abusing, and God judged them. So uh, every, every sacrifice you brought, the Levites would take a portion and burn it for God. The rest went to their homes for food. So they had plenty of food. Those who say, we don't eat meat, the Levites were eating a lot of meat. But I'm not saying you should eat it in excess. Maybe the Levites, probably they were too fat. I don't know, because they were eating a lot of meat. Every sacrifice you brought, just the breast went to God. The rest went to their homes. And the tithe was the annual one, which at the end of the harvest you brought to them. And Paul, Paul said that you shouldn't muzzle the ox when it is treading the corn. And the same principle applied. This one, he brought it from the Old Testament and applied it in the New Testament as well. So anybody who has dedicated himself to do the work of God, especially full-time, but today we should encourage by vocational uh, ministry work because people are not hard-pressed with money. Otherwise, you have to manipulate people all the time to get money to feed ourselves and to take care of God's work. And so by vocational ministry should be encouraged. But those who are in full-time, they should be Paul talked about a double portion. People think the double portion is about be giving them thrones to sit on. They say uh, those deserve double portion, and therefore, instead of all of us sitting on this one, we should give a double chair for them to sit on. No, he was talking about taking good care of those who have devoted themselves fully to the work of God. He did not want to take advantage of that. Peter and the others, they did. They were fully involved in the work of God. And wherever they went, the churches took care of them. They, let, they lived in their homes. They cooked for them for as long as they would stay. And then he said, make sure you send them off. It means 
take care of their transport when they are coming. And so those who are fully involved, whether part-time or full-time, they need to be adequately taken care of. Otherwise, instead of focusing on prayer and the word, they will also be going about looking for something to eat, rent, and school fees and other things, and then they will come to church and give you just anything without meditation, without prayer, without study, because they won't have time to study and to do that. And so, yes, uh, those who have devoted themselves, the church must take care of them well. Now, what are the needs, somebody asks, now, uh, uh, which he thought should necessitate the tithe. But if you go to many churches and you look at their budgets, look at how much goes into evangelism and soul winning and, 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 and Bible study and teaching. A lot of it goes into maintaining the structures and paying bills. A greater percentage. And when you, when you look at welfare for the needy of those who are inside, very, very, very small. That should have taken the, the greater percentage than building huge structures that require a lot of maintenance, a lot of money to maintain. Some churches, their, their light bills are so much because they have extravagantly... They have, I went to a certain man's house. An electrician in my, in my church, a deacon, took me to where he was working. And the house had 260 light bulbs. And some churches will want to do that. Of course, it's beautiful, but it comes at a cost. And therefore, when somebody needs some help, we can't because all the monies have gone into some capital expenditure. And so we should be careful, look at the actual needs of the church. The real needs are soul winning, taking care of those who are in, in the church if they have needs. And how do we prevent the situation where people will stop giving because we are saying that we shouldn't mandate them, oblige them to do that? Uh, that is left to the individual because they say it is not mandatory if you will not give. It is up to you because we are giving as part of our worship to God. Just as we lift up our hands and we sing, we also give. A good Christian who is being discipled would want to give. One of the marks of good discipleship is giving to support God's work and giving to support the needy around you. That is one mark that you are growing spiritually. So if because we are not teaching people to grow spiritually, we are going to use Old Testament laws to make them give, then we are in trouble. But if we should teach them to grow in their discipleship, one mark of discipleship is wanting to give to support God's work and to support the needy. So there should be no fears. If we want to do the hard work of teaching people and letting them know and understand God's word, we won't have any fears that if we, if we don't force them, they will not give. But forcing people to give for them to go and regret later, we have not helped them at all because whatever blessing that should come will not come. They give. You force them to give. Or a certain woman told me that, uh, she was having problems with her husband at home. The husband was abusing her, and she went to report to the pastor in the office. As soon as she finished, the man uh, uh, went to his laptop and went to the data and checked. Ah, okay, you, you have arrears of five months of tight. I'm not surprised that your husband is beating you. <laughs> and the woman was shocked, pastor. What has my arrears got to do with the misbehavior of my husband in the house? You see how we connect them. Because you don't pay tithes, that's why you are dying. Your children are dying. Because you don't pay tithes, that's why your business is flopping. Is God so fixated on 10% as a magical percentage that brings blessings? No. Whatever you give freely, sincerely from your heart to God, whatever percentage, God respects that. And God will bless you in proportion to that.
Then sowing and, and, and reaping financially. Uh, yes, yeah, sowing and reaping, yes, we have said it is okay. The Paul says that. But we should be careful that we don't commit the sin of simony. Simony is when Simon, when he saw the power of God at work through Peter, thought that, no, I can exchange it with money. So he went to Peter, Peter, take this money and transfer some of that power to me so that when I also lay hands on anybody, the person will receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said, your money perish with you. You think you can buy the gift of God with your money. So sowing to tap into grace is serious. It's still money. So I see, I see many churches. They have even erected altars here. And while the sermon is going on, people are coming, getting up. Is it not the distraction for those who want to pay attention and listen to the word? Somebody can come about five times. He will come and put five CDs, go back. When he hears another word, he will come and put five CDs. This is called simony. It will attract a rebuke and a curse from God. Those pastors who are doing that, I wish I could advise them. They are not helping their people because you cannot buy the gift of God with money. You should just give us worship to God. And I am told that all this is about money. I am told that as for those, they are not even counted. They collect them straight to the pastor's house. This is an abuse of the highest order. Sowing into grace. A, a, a certain one of our pastors told me that he accompanied a wife to a prayer retreat. And they were getting up early in the morning to pray every morning. And when you go, the prayer leader has the prayer topics on the screen, which they are going to pray about that very morning. And the prayer leader will say, if I were you, I will sow into this topic. I mean, what is this? <laughs> I am coming to pray to God. You have given me a topic to pray on. I must give money and sow into the topic, even before I pray. This is abuse. <laughs> God help us. And it is all about money. Now, this is another question online. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mano. Please, how do you suggest men of... Oh, we, we have read that. How related is Abraham Titan to Melchizedek uh, to... The Levitical law. Could Moses be likely adopting this either way cultural in yes, yes, that's what I said. It was a practice that was there before the law of Moses. God incorporated that customary practice into his law for his people. And this is not the only time. Do you know Jerusalem was there before God took it to be a holy city? Jerusalem was a Jebusai city that was there long before. But when God wanted to adopt it and make it a holy city, he took it and he sanctified it and it became a holy city for God. And he built his temple there for his worship. And so Titu was a practice. And God used it and incorporated it into his law. Until it became part of the law of Moses, God had nothing to do with tithing. So Abraham's tithe was not a commandment of God. It is customary practice of his time. And he met a king, and so he paid taxes to him after going to battle and getting booty. It was not his income. It was tax he was paying. He, 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 tax, he, he Christian, he levy. <laughs> this was his Hebrew, Hebrew, he levy, which Abraham paid to Melchizedek. <laughs> Please, is it wrong for the church as an organization to make tithing as one of its requirements? Of, for membership, this is serious. That if you don't pay tithes, you cannot become a member. This one is very serious. Tithes nowhere in the New Testament is even giving vo voluntarily made a condition for membership. Somebody told me that he belonged to a certain church. And the certain church, if you're a visitor, you can be allowed to go in 
uh, without questions. But if you're a member, unless you show your tight card fully paid at the entrance, you will never be allowed to enter. Then another preacher I was listening to from America said if he had the power, he would make a, an electronic uh, doors at the entrance of the church and give everybody a tight a, a, a plastic card that if you do the, if you go there and you, you, you swipe it and you have paid your tax, your tight fully, the door will open for you to enter. If you have not, the door will not open for you to enter the church. <laughs> this is serious. Eh? So it should not be made a condition for membership of a church. Aquia says, if we are to go voluntary giving to the church, don't you think that would encourage Christians not to give to the church? That's what we have answered. A true Christian will not want to uh, give to support a worthy cause in the church. A true, it's, it's because we are not making disciples. Because we are not making disciples, we are making just people joining the church. So that's for them. We have to use some laws to bind them to give. But if you are making true disciples, disciples wouldn't want to be forced to give. They would want to give. In the Bible, people even give 100%, and even more than 100%, without any compulsion. The poor people of 2 Corinthians, that Paul said, Paul even didn't want to collect their tithe. They begged him. This time, the giver was begging the taker to take it. They begged Paul, please, don't deny us, even though you see us as poor as we are. We want to give. And they gave what they, 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 they were able. And more than they were able, which means they gave more than 100%. These were people who have been touched by God. The Bible says in Second Corinthians, they gave themselves first to God. After you have given yourself first to God, you think that every other thing you have belongs to God. But when people have not given themselves to God, you have to force them to give the other things that they have. So you have to go and take an Old Testament law and come and buy them and frighten them. I read about uh, Bishop Dagi was in his book. 88 cases for those who don't pay tithes. 88 cases. By the time you reach 44, you're already dead. <laughs> Please, is it appropriate to use that money? to assist the poor and the needy in society rather than to send it to church. Uh, this is not good. Needy in society, who are those? Uh, 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 these people standing by the junctions uh, are begging for arms. Money you should go and give to your church for soul winning and to support the work of the church. You say, no, I would rather go and give it to those who are standing by the roadside. Some of them hate God. Some of them hate Christ. Some of them don't even want to get well. Tell them you will take them to hospital. They say, no, we want to sit here and beg. <laughs> Go and waste your money on that. Instead of going to give it to your church, no. Your church first. The work of God first. And then later on, if you have any excess to give to those who are standing by the roadside, please do. Is giving voluntary and monetary laundry since some um, Christians perceive giving from your income every month will one day open a blessing gate, uh, I didn't understand that. But yes, giving voluntarily and freely from your heart will really attract a blessing from God. That one, there is no doubt about that. But don't turn God into a vending machine or a lottery machine that you go, you, you put it in, and you are waiting. Uh, somebody has a question. Can I give and expect? No, give us worship. Even in the Old Testament, they give us worship. That is why in front of you, the priest will burn your sacrifice. If you want to collect the ashes, collect the ashes. It's burnt in front of you so that your, your, your gift is gone. Forget about it and just go home. God himself, in his own time, looking at your needs, will bless you. So don't say, God, I want to marry. So uh, how, much, how much do you know God wants before he gives you a wife? You go and give him 10 CDs and you think it is enough. Maybe he needs 1,000 before he gives you a wife. 
Okay, I think you can. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we've answered a lot of the online questions. So let's come to the in-person guests. Um, yes, there is one. No, there was somebody who was waiting in line here. Please come forward. And you also join. Uh, no, don't start moving. Don't, don't, don't move yet. Uh -huh. When I signal you, you move. So one, two, three. I will come to you. So let's ask those questions quickly. My name is Ebenezer Osafano. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, when I read Malachi 3, 10 and 11, the 11 gives me the understanding that business protection is a precondition of the tight they ask in verse 10. If you can throw more light on that, and if you can read to the hearing of all. Hello, come to this one quickly. Thank you very much. Please, my name is Benjamin, a student of University of Ghana. I want to ask this question that um, we've met a couple of Christians who make certain statements like, I pay tight and it works for me. Where the person has a genuine concern with this, his or her business, he pays tight and then the business runs well. Is it that God ignores the fact that it's a lie that is mandatory and still blesses them? And so because of that, should we do it? Now, the second question has to do with a very popular phrase, as far as giving this concern, that we shouldn't come into the house of God empty-handed. Can you please touch on that a bit? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jacob Ajete from Evangelical Baptist. And I want to salute my lecturers, my former lecturer, Reverend Amivenku, and then my other former lecturer. Uh, God bless them both. Uh, my question is that if we, a pastor or a denomination agrees that um, tithing is not mandatory for the New Testament believer, but wants to go ahead with tithing, but in this case, we don't make it mandatory. Uh, since the New Testament endorses uh, mandatory or voluntary giving, and we have forms of voluntary giving in the church like Kofi and Ama, Deuce and what have you. Can't we adopt the tithing system and just maintain the name tithing, but this time around it's New Testament model and not mandatory? Thank you very much. Doc will respond, but on the back of his last question, we got a message from Dr. Dre J. in Kolebu saying that great program, great presentation. I am for tight, but should not be compulsory. Okay, Doc, respond. Okay. Uh, one New Testament professor uh, said that if the churches think that the 10% and they want to adopt it, they can go ahead. But they shouldn't mislead the church that it is God who says they should do that. So as a church, we can come together with the leadership and say, okay, every worker who earns a salary, give 10% of your income to support the church. Without quoting Malachi that God says, if you don't do it, he will curse you. Or without quoting Deuteronomy to say, God says you should do it. As for God, he has never said any Christian should do that. So if you are talking to Christians and you are going to mandate them because God says you will be misleading them, you will be lying, you will be bending the scriptures. So if you think that 10% works for your church, just have a meeting with the whole church and said, everybody, depending or regardless of what, what you do, bring 10% as your contribution towards the running of the church. But I bet you if you don't add Malachi, they will still not do it. You have to disciple them. 
if you don't add Malachi, like somebody said, if you don't say God will bless your business, they will not. Once it's voluntary, it depends on the level of spirituality of the person. If the person loves God and wants to worship him voluntarily without expecting anything, they will give to support the work of God. This is a fear. That's why we don't want to teach the truth and we want to hide behind Old Testament to mislead people. So if you want to go ahead and ask everybody to give 10%, please do. But explain to them that it's not, because, it's not God who says you should do it. We, the church, are asking you to do it to support what we do. And if you are lucky and they do it, fine. But don't quote any Malachi. And then somebody also mentioned Malachi. Uh, whether uh, uh, God will not bless your, uh, your business. In fact, Malachi is an advice by a prophet to the nation of Israel, ancient Israel, who had neglected the Levites because they had stopped paying their tithes. And I'll give you the history behind Malachi chapter 3. It was all in the days of Nehemiah when Cyrus released them from exile and said they could go back and rebuild the temple. When he came and realized that the gates were, were burnt, the walls were down, and he mobilized people to rebuild the wall and the gates. One thing he realized was that the Levites were all not where they were supposed to be, so the worship of God was not also going on. So, and he realized that their storehouse for keeping the tithes, somebody had rented it to Tobias, an enemy of Israel. And that is why the people of Israel had refused to bring their tithes to the storehouse. The storehouse that we will keep the, 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 the tithes for the Levites to depend on to ensure that we worship God has been rented out to Tobias, who is an enemy of God. So the first thing Nehemiah did was to go and sack Tobias from the storehouse and clean it up. And then Malachi the prophet came and said, the, Nehemiah was the governor, Malachi was the prophet. Now bring, now Tobias is gone. The storehouse is empty. Now bring your tithes. And when they did, the Levites came back. And then the worship of God resumed. That was the reformation of worship in the days of Nehemiah. This has nothing to do with Christianity in the 21st century. So stop quoting Malachi and Malachi and Malachi and Malachi to, to, to confuse people and to put fear in them that if you don't, God will destroy your business. Yes, it was the duty of the priest. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if pastors really believed that tithing brings blessings, they don't. We don't. We are most of your pastor. We don't. <laughs> if we did, we will not spend 40, 45 minutes imploring people to bring it. We would rather take the little we have and also go and sow it. If we did really believe that 10% brings certain blessings. Why are, we, why are we worrying the people? At least you have something. Go and also give 10% and always be receiving. We don't believe it. That's why we are asking you to bring it to us. <laughs> then the testimonies. I have had testimonies and testimonies and testimonies and testimonies about people who pay tithes. There was this woman preacher I, I watched on TV at a conference in the UK. She's a Nigerian preacher who is at a conference in the UK. And she's giving testimony about tithes. How tithes is miraculous money you shouldn't touch. Say there was a woman in her church who went to the grocery store to buy groceries. And when she finished collecting what she needed and got to the, the what, how do you call it? The counter to pay, she realized that she collected more than she had money for. But she had put the tithes, as, far, as soon as she collected her money, she put the tithes in a white envelope, but it was in her bag. So she had to pray quietly, God, I beg you, let me borrow from your money. And uh, 
and, and, and pay the groceries. When I get home, I will quickly put it back. This woman, according to the preacher, searched for this envelope throughout. Uh, she overturned the bag, never found the, the envelope. Yes, no. When she went home, as soon as she opened the bag, it was lying on top of the thing. Then I said, this woman is lying. <laughs> then she said, in Nigeria too, there, there was robbery in, a, in, a, in an apartment building. And robbers were coming. And the woman remembered that she had her tight card. So she slipped the tight card under her door. And the robbers jumped over her apartment and went to the others. And then she said there was another one. There was fire in the market. And the fire was burning shops. And this woman remembered that, ah, my tight card is here. And then she also put it at the junction between her shop and another. The fire burnt to that place and stopped. I said, all oh, these are lies. Has she gone to check those whose shops were burnt, whether they also don't pay tithes? They pay. They pay in their churches. But their shops were burnt. The robbers entered their houses and robbed them. Testimonies are not what we are talking about. We are talking about scripture, interpreting scripture. Even if it worked for somebody, don't, don't listen to her testimony. Listen to what the word of God says. Even if the word of God doesn't work for you, that is the word of God. It may work for you another time. Don't listen to testimonies. Testimonies are not God's word. They are people's experiences. And what scientific, scientific study has he done to show that it is the 10% he paid? That is why his business did well. What is the connection? There is no connection in the scriptures. Please. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, you've said almost everything. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the... the the personal stories the doctor was uh, referring to. Remember, those are just anecdotes. They are private, they are personal, they are individual. They are not universal. If God wanted us to rely on individual experiences, he would not reveal the Bible. So stop listening to those claims. Like Dr. Amano said, if Titan worked all the magic that have been preached to us, why are we spending ourselves trying to convince people that it works? Why? There's no reason why we should try to convince people if it, is, if it works so well. So there is diff there's a difference between manipulation and ministry. They all begin with M. But <laughs> ministry is not manipulation. In any case, uh, somebody wanted, wanted us to read uh, Malachi 3, 10 and 11 in particular. I suggest to you that you should also read 12. 12. Read it to yourself and see what is there. The 12 suggests that if you give the tithe, uh, all nations around will call you blessed and what, what, what. So, Ghana, we've been collecting all these tithes. Are we blessed? Who is proud, with Ghana? Who is proud of Ghana? Look at our, our, our city. If you want $200 now, when, when my friend said $200, some of you assume it's equal to 1,000 Ghana. It's not. <laughs> I wanted $200 the other day. I went to ANC shopping mall. I paid nearly $1,600. $200. That's our currency. We've been paying the tight. All this while, we were told that prosperity gospel is the Messiah to save us from socioeconomic, uh, our socioeconomic downturn. And we've been preaching this for nearly 50 years. So what has happened? Why are we still struggling with e-levy and all this? So we need to put logic to some of the claims. One other comment. All the people who asked questions and wanted to refer to pastors said, men of God. Did you hear that? Men of God, men of God. Ha'ish Elohim. Men of God, men of God. Some people even refer to female pastors as men of God. I've seen it before. <laughs> See, it's just, it's just a, an obsession. It's an obsession, cliche. Man of God, man of God, even if the person is a woman. So please, let's, let's put some logic to the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, um, Doc, we, some of our 
online guests are, are begging to give us donation. So since it's not mandatory, we can take, okay. So they're asking for the number. Um, Dr. Doc Kasopok from Kolebu says, please, where do we send our offering support to? Please. It's 54 I round over that again. 054-028-6052. Please, the media room, I don't know whether you, there's a way of putting this number online because it keeps coming where they are to pay to. This one too. This is Isabella Ado saying, please, the Momo number again. Where do we send it? So please, so they are begging. So let the number be displayed. Yes. And when you send the Momo, you will not see Berry Academy. You will see Crossroads Community Church. And I think that is, it was not premeditated, but it's good because I'm told now when this is church, they will not charge e levy. So, <laughs> so when you send the money, you will find Crossroads Community Church. That's the, 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 the church that uh, uh, houses Berry Academy. So the money will come to us. Um, God bless you. Yes, the questions we skipped. Please. There was a young man here in black and white, long sleeve. I said we'll take. Okay, who has a question? Please come. I think we'll be taking the last round of questions. Because we are on the top of the hour, one o'clock. So please come forward. You two come. And then. And yes. Let's be quick about it so we can get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Gideon Blessing Kwe. Uh, my question goes on Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Jesus said, O unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of men and owners, and come in, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. This ought ye to have done, and have not leave the order undone. My question is, I want to find out if Jesus is for or against tithe. If Jesus is for or against tithe, in contest to what I've been said. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for the, for the good uh, lecture. So I want to, I have a concern. I want you to help me with it. I want to read um, Matthew chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 3. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, uh, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, so this brings me to my question on the way we give in church. So do we have to do it publicly and announce the amount we give, or we can apply this verse to the way we give? Thank you. Um, Doc, um, I think your lecture is bringing us to 
a place to understand that Titan in the old covenant will say it's no more or has been abrogated because like the scripture says in Hebrews if the law was without effect there was no need to have been a new one so if somebody will come and say I'm adopting tight in the old testament in my church today I think that would be disastrous or it's dangerous because how do you bring something that has been abrogated and say I'm adopting it how does that work I think I will take that down before Doc comes I think he made it clear that churches can agree to do something so if the church's agreement that everybody is gives terms attempts to support the work that is the church's decision that one you can, is their right you cannot take from them so let's take the answers to the rest of the question but doc i will read two more online somebody asked if those old practices were irrelevant to christians why are they still using them can it also suggest that the bible was written to suit some interest Oh, uh, as Dr. Miles Morrow said, there's a purpose to everything. And if you don't know the purpose of a thing, you abuse it. God did not just arbitrarily give the, the, the Bible. Everything was written for a certain purpose. Every practice in the Bible is for a certain purpose. So the Old Testament was written as a Hebrew scriptures for the old, ancient, not even modern day Jews, oh. The Old Testament is not even for modern day Jews. It is for ancient Israel. Those who lived in the days of the Old Testament till the day till before the death of Jesus. All the Jews who live after the death of Jesus, they apply the Old Testament illegally. They are using it only politically to to abuse the Palestinians and take their land. When it comes to that, they will go and take the Old Testament and say, God gave this land to us. The land God gave to the ancient Israel started from the borders of Egypt all the way to Iraq. Let them go and claim it right now and see. So modern day Jews cannot even apply the Old Testament to themselves today. It is for ancient, those who lived till the death of Jesus, because the death of Jesus is what abrogated that old covenant. We who live after the death of Jesus, we have to be in the new covenant. And the new covenant has nothing to do with any piece of land. It is eternity. Abraham looked for a city whose foundation and builder is God. Not the nation that Jebusites built. Yeah, seven Canaanite nations. They owned the land. And God just drove them out and gave it to his people. God did not build the, the land of Israel. He only used his authority to sack some people and give it to his people. <laughs> Abraham did not look to that land. He looked to a land that is eternal. So the new covenant, we are looking at eternity. We are, not, we are not fighting for any land for us to go and use the Old Testament to say God gave this land to us. God gave it to a certain people and he delivered it to them. They lost it because of their own uh, stubbornness. Matthew 23, 23. Uh, if you read it very carefully, Jesus is t talking to Pharisees. As for them, it is their law. It is their practice. So Jesus is not against tithing if ancient Israelis were practicing it. He only wanted them to do it well. But Pharisees who are supposed to do what was in the law of Moses the right way has nothing to do with Christians today. So Jesus was talking to Pharisees who were not tithing properly, and he said they should do it because it is their law. So he says, uh, but do you, if you look at that scripture very well, 
what it appears to be saying is that when it comes to vegetables, the, the people of Israel, ancient Israel, readily gave the 10%. When it came to cattle, they kept it. The weighty abates. The small, small vegetables and pepper and garden eggs, they already divided 10% and send it to the Levites. When he has to count his animals and take one whole bull and go, he said, No, I said, No, I don't know. He, 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 we tell my test of the Lord. Those are the things you just seem to be talking about. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with us. It is ancient Israel. So, yes, Jesus is not against tithing if Israelis are applying it. But for Christians, he never said we should do so because we don't have any Levites, we don't have any temple. Our worship is not based on a physical temple and a human priesthood. Jesus himself is our high priest, and we all are priests. If tithing should be encouraged, then after that we should share it, because we are all the priests. <laughs> I heard uh, my father was a border guard, so we used to, we used, we used to live in villages in the western region. I used to attend some Methodist church. There was a problem in the church one day, and they, they couldn't solve the problem. So one day at the meeting at the church, at the church one man lifted up his hand and said, you see, I have a solution. Let's close this church <laughs> down. <laughs> and, but before we do, let us do an accounting of all the monies that we have collected. Share it and everybody go home. <laughs> So if Titan is to be encouraged in the New Testament church, we are all the priests. After every Sunday, we should count and share it, and everybody take your share and go. <laughs> but I know some churches, eh, it is not even counted, though. It is collected and sent to the pastor's house because he is the Levite. So I tell my church people, me, I am an Osunani. I am Osunani. I am not a Levite. If you bring me your task, me, I'll chop it, but you'll get a blessing. Because <laughs> I am not a Levite. <laughs> now, I'll give you in public. In fact, what you read, it also doesn't apply to Christians anyway, but he was talking about alms giving. If you want to give alms to the poor, don't announce it. We can apply it anyway. We can apply it to our churches, but it's not directly related to Christianity. It is a Jewish practice of alms giving. There were three pillars of Judaism fasting, prayers, three times prayers in a day, and then alms giving. These were all Jewish, the, the pillars of Judaism, these three pillars. They mark the righteousness of a Jew. So if you are going to give alms to the poor, don't go to Peace FM and announce. I am going to the roadside, oh, I am going to give alms to the beggars over there. No, that's what Jesus is saying. But of course, we should apply it, or we can apply it by not making too much noise about how much people give. Sometimes, like we did, if you brought a thousand, you say, a thousand people stand here, 500 people stand here, ten people, ten cities for stand here, then we ask for the chief prophet to pray for the thousand people, then the assistant prophet to pray for the... <laughs> The 500. Then the deacon, pray for the 10 cities. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I think uh, that was a good response. Let's, let's put our hands together for Doug for such. So, do we have any in house question again? Exhausted. No, there's no one. There is a hand up. No, you have been here already. So, please, I, I said don't start moving until I call you. You have moved. <laughs> so, please just remain there. Okay, you two, be on your... You, yes, yes, yes. So, those, those will be the last two in-house questions. But, Doc, some of the online guests seem to be at the crossroads. They asked two questions I want you to attend to. So, thank you, Doc. So, in churches... Where tithes are mandatory, how do we, how do we enlighten members 
not to pay the tithe but give out of their free will. Again, in some churches where fighting is recorded and is strongly associated with membership, what should members do in the light of this lecture? Thank you. This, is, this is actually very difficult because if you belong to a church where they believe in that and they insist on that, it's difficult. If you, you, it's difficult to violate your pastor uh, when he says that, well, especially when it is recorded. I am told that in some of the churches, if you're a minister and they check your records and you don't pay your tithes, you'll be demoted. Or if you don't change, you'll be defrocked. On the basis of the fact that you don't pay that, maybe you are, maybe you are even giving more than 10%. They don't want that. They want the 10%. It's a magical percentage. Even if you want to give 50, we don't want that. Give 10. Do we even believe in this principle? If we believe that if we give, God will give us plenty. Who has ever paid tithes and, and didn't have enough store room to store his blessings? The person should show up. Because that's what Malachi says. That you have blessings that you have room enough to store. Is there anybody in this world who has been faithful in tithing and he didn't have enough room to store his blessings? Why do we continue to pay? Then you pay once and you are okay. Because your storeroom is full. You don't have extra storeroom to store. And so if you belong to a church where they insist, it's difficult. So you have to pray for God to guide you. But if, it's, if you are so convinced, then probably that church is not your church. It means you have to leave and go to another place. If they insist that if you don't pay, you, you are not a member then probably you may have to advise yourself. Or if they record and they say that uh, your mother passed away, even though you are active in all other areas, apart from your record, because you believe that you should give it voluntarily, maybe you are even giving 20%, sometimes 50 sometimes whatever, but they don't, they don't want, they want to record the 10%, and you insist that you will not do it, and because of that, they are denying you services in the church. Probably that church is not your church. I don't know. I, 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 you have to let God guide you. This is difficult, especially if you're an assistant pastor and you have come to hear this and you are convinced and you go and your senior pastor requires your record. What are you going to do? So maybe you can, you can give your 10% to satisfy the church's uh, requirement but in you, you know that you are not obeying any law of Moses. You know you are giving to support God's work. Maybe that is one way you can go around it. Otherwise, if you are in an environment where they believe in it so much, and you alone, you want to be a rebel, it's difficult. So come to our church. We, we are free. We don't collect. You are free. Come. On voluntary, okay. <laughs> voluntary, yes. Actually, actually, it's both. The decision to give is voluntary. And how much to give is also voluntary. The percentage to give is also voluntary. But like I'm saying, a true disciple of Jesus will not want anybody to compel him to give to support the work of God. In fact, he would rather be looking out for opportunities if he's blessed with resources to give. And so, yes, it's voluntary. But if you're a true disciple you voluntarily also decide to give and to give something that will meet the needs of the church. It was not answering it. 
Okay, ask again. There. Maybe come with a Bible. <laughs> that is an Old Testament scripture. And what you should come with was sheep or goat. Not a, a wallet full of money, no. Come with goat. So if you want to apply it, everybody come with goat to church. Or sheep. Or bull. So that scripture doesn't apply to us. But at least if you want to apply it, come with your Bible. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, we've done justice to all the questions that there are. I believe that the 10th edition of the Berea Public Lecture, as we said from the beginning, has been very interesting. We still want everybody to get a copy of the book, the book on today's topic. So I ask that the, the ushers go around with the book. You pick one, you give us a donation of 30 cities and above. So I say and above, it means it's not mandatory. Uh, there is a. <laughs> <laughs> it's voluntary. So, um, can the ushers quickly move around whilst we do that? We will be inviting a dear brother to give us the vote of thanks. Um, we're skipping the chairman's remark because our, our, our friend, our, our guests have done enough today and we've had enough to today. So the ushers are going around. Please get a copy, grab a copy. Give us a donation of 30 cities or more. You can buy one for a friend. You can buy it for a pastor friend or some. Just, just voluntarily get it and get it for them. So our catch word today is voluntary, isn't it? Yeah, so we are putting a double strike through mandatory and then we are keeping voluntary. We want to welcome our brother, um, a demand to give us the vote of thanks. Then the El Dunamis Minister will give us our closing hymn, and then we will take our closing prayer from Pastor Nicholas Tete, and then we'll come with some announcement, and we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Tamaklo. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank Almighty God for this beautiful day. Indeed, we prayed for a very beautiful weather that was free from rainstorms and life-threatening floods so that we can have a successful program. And we thank God for his blessings. Our hearty gratitude also goes to the several persons who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure the success of this program. God bless all of us and all of you. We also would want to thank the various sponsors who have helped us financially in, and in other ways to make this program a success. Uh, God bless you. We are mindful of um, uh, Special Eyes and then um, the Despite group of companies, indeed, and then, of course, the other individuals who have you know, um, helped us financially, God bless you. We also want to thank the El Dynamis Choral Group for their unfailing presence and their careful selection of local Ghanaian chorals to make the program colorful. God bless you so much. Our gratitude also goes to Auntie Ifia, the wife of our distinguished speaker, for her guidance in recruiting the right form of people to offer organizational, logistical, and administrative support toward the success of this program. God bless her indeed. We thank the chair and members of the planning committee for all the investments made into the success of the program in coordinating tax and other support systems to make this program successful. 
We are also grateful to God for the life and health of our speaker over the years, Dr. Amalo, who has always I mean, delivered to delight to bless this August guest. God bless you, Dr. Amalo. We also want to thank our affable MC, Pastor Tamaklo, for always delighting us with your great sense of humor. God bless you as well. Our deep gratitude also goes to our distinguished chairman and friend of Berry Academy, Pastor Pra. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Bishop Pra, God bless you so much. Always seeing you is an encouragement, and we thank God also for your friendship to this ministry. And now to you, our distinguished guests. Without you, we'll not be here. The smiles, the support, and the encouragement. God bless all of you, and I echo to all of you. And we pray that another time we'll see more of you here. God bless you too. To all our special guests and members of my church, CRCC, God graciously bless you all, also for your support behind the scenes. And now, to our God and Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who give us this beautiful day and a successful lecture, we say glory and praise to him. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Yes, well, well, thank you for doing us the honors. Uh, there was one we left out. As we saw earlier, and we did announce, we had in attendance our former first lady, Mrs. Matilda and Ms. Atta. Sorry, second lady, Mrs. Matilda and Ms. Atta, but she stepped out a while ago. She also gave us a donation, but she voluntarily wanted to remain anonymous, so we're keeping it that way. So, Auntie Tilly, we say God bless you. El Dunamis, Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Please, is the closing hymn. So, shall we all be up standing as we sing it together?
Let's close our eyes for closing prayer. The Bible says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our life. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. For some of us, we came here simple, but we are living here informed. The Bible says the entrance into your word, it gives light. We thank you for enlightening us through your word. Help us, O oh God, I will seek only the truth and nothing else. It's our prayer that this truth that you have shared unto us today will live on and will be able also to influence others with this truth. We thank you for the minister. We thank you for the lecturer. We ask so that you continue to, O oh God, Open his understanding into your word. That every moment is stand to minister, to teach your word. Knowledge and understanding shall be unto your people. We are living here. We ask to God for your presence to go with us. For those of us who sat in cars, your word say you will preserve our going out and our coming in. We pray for divine covering and divine protection. Let the blood of Jesus cover every individual and lead us to our various home and our various destination. We thank you and we bless you. And to him, the God who is able to keep us from falling, the God who when he say yes, no one can say no, the God who doesn't need approval from men to bless us, that God bless you. That God open doors for you. That God make you stand in the truth. That God reveal himself more to you. So that your ultimate objective is to please him and to live for him. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, before the earth dynamics give us a song to get out of here, a few announcements. Uh, at the back of the program, you see there's advert there for Berea Academy. Berea Academy is admitting students into the 51st term. It's a theological, non-denominational theological school at Hacho. Here in Accra, and we are inviting as many who sends the call of God upon their life, and those who want to know God in a deeper way, please get enrolled. The fees are very affordable. The lectures, very flexible schedules. So please check with the front decks and then get enrolled. You can pick a Roman phone for somebody you think will be a blessing if attends the school. Also, there is the Berea Ministers Fellowship, which is a fellowship of ministers of God and church workers from all walks of life from all denominations, and we meet bi-monthly to do what we call continuous theological education. The man of God need to study to get himself approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So every other month, we meet at Hacho, at the Crossroads Community Church, where we have seminars to build our capacity to work more effectively for Jesus. So we invite you all. Once you registered at the front desk, you'll be getting text alerts from us telling you of when we are meeting. When you get the text, please come to come. Let's study together to to build our capacity to work for Jesus. God bless you for coming. Once again, it's a pleasure being your MC. I'm Imano Tamaklo. You are welcome. So give us a song to take us home. God bless you. Oh, 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 oh,
Jesus. 
Rejoice.